minutes in the flag Eric, salute. Let us know. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Please note for the record all council members are present. Okay. Adoption of the agenda. Move to adopt. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Brings us to a budget workshop on, under item A, which is department presentations. And the first up is public works, pages 109 through 156. Don't hurt your back. Carrying all them pages. No. <laughs> No, sir, this would be if I were carrying the reports we turn in the Regional Water Quality Control Board. Okay. That would really hurt my back. <laughs> so welcome back. Well, thank you. It was lovely to be back. I had, had a lovely trip, and I was just telling some of the colleagues, actually, uh, because of the locations I was in, had some really neat experiences that kind of directly relate to the job. Certainly being in Amsterdam gave me a unique perspective on complete streets and, right. and what you can really do with a community if you want, where the bicycle mode of transportation has the highest priority there, right. over pedestrians, oh, yeah. and, and certainly over cars, and it was neat to... <clears throat> to be in a couple of communities that were like that because both the Netherlands and Luxembourg uh, very similar It was also neat to be able to be in a place like the Netherlands and all of the low countries where you can look at how they deal with rising sea level Because oh, yeah. they're all four meters below sea level. Right. So it's sort of a an you interesting Dutch boy with a finger in a dike I did, you, know, <laughs> you know, they have some giant pumps. They really don't need him anymore But then the other experience I did get to uh, to go on a high-speed rail I took the Talus high-speed oh. rail from Amsterdam uh, down to Brussels and very anticlimactic that that high-speed rail yeah. is located in a part of the country that is just blah and it's underground a lot but it gave me a, a, I think a, a good perspective on, on the sorts of things <coughs> being proposed in California and it gave me an opportunity to look at uh, the operations and maintenance yards and such is that it traditional or is it magnetic levitation it's traditional mm -hmm. it's true it's the, the talus is an older one and even the TGV the the French one the train on the test is not is not maglev yet but Interesting experience. My family had no idea that we were actually going on a civil engineering field trip, but uh, <laughs> they tolerated it quite well, so it was good. It was a good experience. Thank you. You always build that in. Huh? <laughs> <clears throat> it's kind of what we do sometimes. <laughs> so, Honorable Mayor, Member Tem Council members, it's nice to be back. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, we'll go through department presentation. Can we bring the lights down just a little bit, please, Wendy? I don't know. Well, there is nobody in the audience, but just so I can see it, perhaps. Thank you so much. So this is the departmental breakout. Right now, with the addition of the marina folks, we've got 22.75 people uh, that are working under public works, and the 0.75 is because we have part-time employees and we just compile them uh, into full-time equivalents. It's interesting when you look at this, it really strikes you that one-third of our workload really is being done by the marina. One-third of the workload is being done by utilities personnel, so if you count the sewer, the water, the GVMID folks. And the admin staff is 12%, and that's a pretty reasonable number for admin. Usually you see admin up to about 15% when you're managing projects and such. A little bit of some oddities in here if you really start to try and drill down into this, because what you start to see is that the low numbers on the right-hand side are the chart where you've got buildings and grounds and turf and landscape. you got to understand that this is reflecting city employees and where their time is being spent. And what's happening in those general fund type accounts is because of the reduction of personnel, what we've done is the one team leader in operations and maintenance has really become a contract and a purchase order manager. So very, very many of those services for those general fund departments are being provided by contractors and he's managing them. So it's one person doing that. Whereas in years past, we had a two person team that was doing turf and landscape. We had a separate person that was assigned fully to streets. We had one person that was assigned full time to Sierra Point landscaping and lighting. Those have all kind of gone away now and we're doing it all under contract. So that's why uh, this particular slide looks the way it does. We were asked the question about, could we give you some examples of how people are spending their time? So this is uh, a chart that represents something we started, it was over 12 years ago when I first came to the city the teams were not particularly structured. They were not assigned to their own unique capabilities. So we sat down and we divided them into three teams at the time. We had a water team, we had a sewer team, and we had the buildings and grounds team, each with a team leader, each with a superintendent or a supervisor working above them. And what this represents is what a three-person team does So if you, in a month. So if you take three people times, you know, four weeks, and you add their hours up, that's what they get. They get You get 480 hours availability. And of course, if you start at the bottom, you see that you know, we have to indicate that there's time for vacation and holidays and sick, and we just sort of average that out. But if you're starting at the top, if you look at daily, really what we have here is what we're telling you is that 
in that very first row that for pump station maintenance, we spend three hours a day going out and maintaining the water pump stations. That's how long it takes us to go out and visit each of the lift stations. So, and then the next column is just simply a conversion factor out there so that we can take that daily task and tell you how many hours we spend in a four week month then to do that. And so that ends up being 60. And so then when you take all these tasks <clears throat> and you total them up at the end, you get the 480 that you would expect to find because you know, we're fully utilizing the hours. But some of the other items that are in there, the contract hours, you see the one item we've got in there, we don't do water sample testing in-house, we pay somebody, we pay a, a technician to come out and do that and to bring them out to the laboratory for us. And then we have the unassigned task, <clears throat> that's sort of a leftover uh, from what we had before. It is something that we still track, it's one of those things that we're trying to I identify for ourselves. There are tasks that we think we need to be doing but with the current resources, we just can't do that. So we don't want to let it drop off the page and just say, well, this is what we've always done, so that's all we, we do. This, is, this kind of helps us and gives us a reminder. So that represents you know, one example of how we keep track of this. We don't update this as frequently as we used to. Um, probably five years ago, when we did have three full teams and three team leaders and we did have the supervisor, we updated this on a monthly basis. Now we update it. Um, a little more casually, it's, we try and use it on a biannually or an annual basis to just kind of say, hey, where have we been? Where are we going? Are we aligning ourselves properly? Uh, it's also a little bit easier now. One of the big reasons we did this as well when I first got here was that we were very upside down in how we were doing maintenance. When I, when I arrived here, we were spending 80% of our time responding to service requests and 20% of our time doing scheduled maintenance, completely backwards. So. We made, we made a real strong effort to do that and to make sure that our focus was on making sure that we're proactively going out there and taking care of the system so that we don't have water quality failures, so that we don't have catastrophic failures that we can avoid. So that's been a good experience. In the last few years, we've implemented the government outreach system, that online system that you can utilize, and that's been really helpful in helping us understand uh, where those requests are coming from, and I'll show you a slide on that later. This is the marina maintenance. This is, this is the, uh, the other side of the house that we picked up. I think the biggest thing that's going to stand out to you here is that, number one, this is just for the full-time maintenance staff. So that's three employees that we have down there now. We have one team leader and two maintenance workers. And you'll recall that the reason we brought two maintenance workers down there was to do the dock repair project. It's supposed to be an 18-month to two-year uh, process. We just got the final uh, employee for that team hired in the last two months, I believe. But you'll see that when you go under schedule monthly resources for staff, they're spending 360 hours a month on dock maintenance. <clears throat> and that's what they should be doing. Mm -hmm. that, that's where we think their maintenance should be. That's what we hired them for, and we're tracking that. I go down, and I've just recently set up a schedule where I go down and meet with the team leader and meet with the harbor master on a bi-weekly basis and get a handle of how they're doing things. Uh, they've been working on dock three pretty solidly. They expect to be done by August. And then we're going to move on to the next dock. I believe it's dock five that we're going to move to. So that, that's going pretty well. They're learning a lot on dock three. So we think we're going to go a little bit faster. It's always one of those things when you take it apart and say, oh, so that's how they put this together. So hopefully they did it the same way on the next dock. And, and we'll be able to, we always hope, right, and that, that maybe they'll have the same dimensions and such. And then at the lower left bottom of this slide, what you see is the things that our part-time employees do. We do have two. Uh, maintenance employees that are down there. One of them works about 20 hours a week. The other is only available on Sunday, so he comes in and does certain tasks. But these are the types of chores uh, that's happening there. <clears throat> this is government outreach. Uh, in the last year, we had 252 requests recorded there. Pretty apparent where the overwhelming majority of our requests are coming in. Maintenance to the building and parks. That's it. That's, that's over half of the requests that we get. And the rest of them are, you know, are relatively evenly distributed. So that's, that's good information to me. Um, I like that. This is one of those things that I check every month. We check to make sure how the closure rate is going. We're doing a little bit of work with the system. We find one of the things that happens is that when we get the request and we schedule a repair, we send an email back to the requester and say, thank you very much. We receive your request. request. It's been scheduled for repair. Unfortunately, one of the things that we just found out about is what the system is doing is then automatically sending a survey out to the person and saying, hey, how did you like it? Was it wonderful? Is it this, that, and the other thing? And, you know, some people say, are you kidding me? It hasn't even been done yet. I just got a note that said you're going to do it. So we're, we're working with the system manager to make sure that that doesn't happen. We're not, it, we're not trying to send the wrong message out to people. But at the same time, we don't want to leave this service request hanging out there for months and months and never getting back to them and saying, hey, we aren't even being a note saying, yeah, we get your request. We're going to get to it. So we're, we're trying to fix that up. 
Uh, new position. There's one person that's proposed in the budget this year. This is going to be in the admin section. It's an engineering technician. This person is going to be working across the department about a quarter of their time in streets and really the overwhelming majority of their time working in water, working in GVMID, uh, working in the sewer system. Uh, the primary reason we're doing this is, I think as the council is well aware, the engineering staff was reduced by 40 percent, uh, primarily by attrition, but during our times when we were, we were struggling a little bit with the economy. One of the items that we're going to be having in future when we raise water and sewer rates, we're talking about the $5.4 million of capital projects that we need to do. Some of those are master plans. Some of those are construction plans. I need the two registered civil engineers that I have left in the department to manage those projects directly. I need their experience. I need their maturity. I need their dedication and knowledge of your system. So in order to do that, I need someone at a sub-professional level. And when I say sub-professional, I mean someone who is not licensed as a professional engineer to get rid of the mundane record-keeping type tasks that they have. So we were joking a little bit about, you know, don't break your arms carrying all that paperwork up here. It's <laughs> just heinous the amount of paperwork that we produce out here, particularly on the water and sewer side of things where there are reports that are happening nearly daily and they take up an incredible amount of time of a licensed engineer when they shouldn't, when it's a task that you could sit down with a non-licensed person who has got some engineering background and you could explain to them what goes on, they could compile the amount of data and then you could in a very quick cursory fashion review it to do a QA, QC check on it and it would be lovely. It would be absolutely fine. So that's why we're proposing this person. Some of the other things that, that this person quick, is going to... efficient fashion. We don't want to be cursory. Uh, uh, yes, okay. I'll accept that. <laughs> I, I will accept that, sir. Um, a couple of the other things that we really don't have the capability to do now in-house is we just have very limited capability to manage any of the database of the city streets that we have, of managing the pavement management system, which is the computer system we utilize to indicate the condition of the streets and which streets should be prioritized for which type of repairs during the year. We can't manage our GIS data. We don't have any limited CAD production capability of small projects. I mean, if, I, if I'm going to do that, I have to turn to my senior civil engineer and say, hey, can you go off and design these plans? And that's just, that, that's just working at the wrong pay grade to be doing that when, when you can have somebody at a, at a non-professional level doing that. So that's why we're, uh, we're requesting these positions. What am I doing now? Am I going to uh, the next slide? I think I'm going to go right into capital projects. Is that where we're at here? In, in the presentation. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, and I think I'm going to do capital projects while I'm up here. Is that right, Wendy? I'm sorry, I'm still not quite sure which time zone or which language I should be speaking here as we, <laughs> as we recover. Fortunately, everybody in the countries we went to was, is very, very good at speaking English. I think there was only one place the entire time where I had a little trouble. We were on the eastern part of Luxembourg, bordering Germany, and the young lady there was trying to tell me in French how much something had cost. We had, we had you know, had some baguettes with pâté in them, and <laughs> I couldn't understand her French, and I have no German capability, so I finally just handed her 20 euro and trusted her to make change properly, and she... I'm sure she did, but but otherwise across the board, if you know how to say hello, goodbye, thank you, it, it, it was just fine. People were more than happy to say, yes, my English is better than your French or German or Dutch, so let's just speak in that language. So capital projects for 24, uh, 14, 15, a little bit of a misnomer because what you will find is that all of the projects in here except for two are have a home in the budget. They are all in one of the departments. Across the board, what we have done with these, if we have placed them in the sub-account 5224, one, which is department special expenses. So that's where they have a home, but we're referring to them as deferred projects because these are things that we haven't done that we need to do and that w these are projects that we're recommending they do, but they are in the operational budget. They're not in a separate capital budget. So here we go. Go through the list. Uh, slope repair at 266 Santa Clara. That's a hillside that's starting to fail on a regular basis. It's up above a fire hydrant. Uh, it's right above the main part of the street. We're getting it into the into the storm drain system, so it needs to be worked on. Mission Blue, we need to do some painting of the interior. We've had the building for a while, we just haven't painted it. Uh, pothole repair, obviously. This is money that we get from Measure M. This is the San Mateo County Measure M that was passed well over 20 years ago now uh, and that we continue to receive funds for. This is That money is actually in two different departments. It's probably irrelevant for our purposes, uh, but that's where it is. That's, that's part of the money that we use in addition to gas tax to pay for uh, paving the streets of your what do you mean, sir? What, what, How is the money raised in Measure M? It's, uh, it's retail tax. It's a quarter percent. It's sales tax? Looking back, yes, sir, sales tax. Mm -hmm. 
This is on page 118, right, Randy? These deferred projects? Um, so, no, I don't know. Are they? Yeah. Is it on 118? Yeah, 118. I mean, I was different ones are on, di uh, there's different yeah. ones on different pages different, throughout. There are different pages. Yeah, the Mission Blue interior is on a different one, but the right. majority of them here, I think. Right. Well, so if you'd like, I could tell you, I don't believe it's consolidated in one place in the budget, is it? It's not. So, I mean, if you'd like, as we go through, instead of me trying to go rapid fire, I could tell you which department each one's in. Okay. But but as, as I said earlier, they're in each of the departments. That's where you found them. And there are two that are not, and I'll point those out to you. Yeah. I get them. That may be easier. Big ones. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, not too bad. Not too bad. They're not too bad. So then uh, on San Bruno Avenue, kind of the backside of uh, San Bruno Avenue, we've got a retaining wall that's starting to fail. Um, so certainly something we'd like to take care of before we had a, have a catastrophic failure down there. Could, could I ask how you're planning to do that? I mean, the style of retaining wall? It, it's, um, so it is not going to be a, a cast-in-place drill, drill pile. We're not going to do a vertical wall. We're going to try and do a setback wall on it. Because uh -huh. I know that, um, you know, they use kind of the hold-the-hill approach. Yes. Um, you know, along other parts of San Bruno Avenue. And I know that has a much better aesthetic. Company. Exactly. That, that's why we're not going to do the uh, the typical. What you see in a lot of places is there's an old standard that was adopted. There was an old set of retaining wall standards that were adopted back when is that the 1,000 block of Sierra Point design was occurring there, the, the one that's on the other side of the canyon. Right. And... You know, the, the cast-in-place H-beams with the wood lagging was right. one standard. I, that has some interesting applications, and it kind of almost fits in with the topography, but I agree with you 100%. That would not be appropriate on San Bruno. So we're going to do a laid-back wall okay. on that, which is why, even though it's a relatively short stretch, it's relatively expensive because to do that, you have to do a much larger excavation. Right. So that's the difference between the two. Well, but. a number of years ago, I, I presented to the council on how to make those aesthetically pleasing, and they went silent on it. Not this council, but another one. Really? <laughs> yeah. I still got it in my computer if you want it. Sure. <laughs> it doesn't hurt. That's the old soldier beam and the wooden one. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you yeah. can put some legs in front of them. And how close is that to the houses on, on San Bruno Avenue? It's not terribly close to the houses, but it's terribly close to a very narrow point in the roadway. Right. And so that's why we don't want it to fail. Because okay. then we would, we would shut down one of the entryways to town. Right. right. If you go over it, you'll see the uh, Visqueen over it with uh, sandbags hanging off the top. <clears throat> And kind of hold the visit. Yeah, that's a lovely spot right there, isn't it? It's just it, that was a temporary thing, and you know, but you know, it's like the temporary K rail on on Bayshore or Blois House Hill. It's so is uh, on that project. Is there any um, responsibility from the property owners for? Oh, that's a, that's a right of way. Our right of way is surprisingly large. Just about everywhere in town, we have a forty foot public right of way, and actually on Tulare, we have fifty feet of width. You would never know that from driving down that street that the city owns 50 feet of width there, but we do. <clears throat> Wipe out half the houses if we yeah. took it. Uh, yeah, okay. that's why I'm on like King's playing. Road. <laughs> and can you talk a little about the slope repair at 266 Santa Clara? Where is that and what? Sure. What, what about it, ma'am? Um, just. So this is if you're, well, if, why? <laughs> yeah, I have, I'm not. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. So, so sure. So if you come in from Santa Clara from Brisbane Elementary School, You've got the big set of houses there. Well, thank you. There's two houses that are close to it. Yeah, well, you've got a, well, what you've got is you've got that first set of units. There's two or three homes that are right there on San Bruno, Santa Clara. And then there's one, two houses down. And then there's kind of an opening of land. And that's where it's, it's really quite steep there. And it's just started to fail and unravel. So if you went out there and looked at it now, the hillside is coming down. And, and it's up above the curb. So we're trying to make sure that it, we, we need to we need to dig into that and lay it back and stabilize it a little bit because it fails a lot on us during the rains and we're out there cleaning it on a pretty regular basis. And what would you propose to to use to stabilize it? It's not a retaining wall. No, 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 no. It's a, it's an excavation type process. Okay. It's an excavation and laying the slope back to the maximum extent that we can. We try and stick with you know na you know a, a typical measure that doesn't require a lot of reinforcement. And that's area that's in between the houses? Yes, it's in between houses right now. Okay. Right. Correct. And are, are these things that have been aggravated by construction above them or just? I think it, no, I, I think in this particular case, it's just the nature of, of the topography we live on. It's pretty steep there. 
it, it's very steep. Yeah. So how is it that there's city property in between the private properties? Wouldn't you? It's because of the width of the roadway that we own. Okay. So it's, it, it is laterally between two houses, or there might even be two full lots there. Okay. But because the city street is 40 feet wide, we own a significant portion of that because the roadway there is not even 20 feet wide. Okay. And the, the opposite side of the roadway is built all the way out to the right-of-way line. So the hillside, the, the uphill side mm -hmm. on that side is not. So we own quite a bit of it. Okay. So let me get to the next slide. Mission Blue Storage Shed. This is just an item that that's the Parks Department has requested that we need to put storage out there for different miscellaneous materials that we have. Um, inside the community center, we've already talked about painting the inside of the community center, but we need to do the lower walls and we need to put a chair rail in or a rug. <coughs> so I'm not, with that, I'm not talking about wainscoting like what we have in here in the building, but just a rub rail is what we're talking about because what we find is that when you have buildings with chairs and people rub up against them, they they damage the paint, and so we end up destroying the paint, and so we think that if we put a rub rail in there, it'll, it'll mitigate a lot of that. The community park gazebo, obviously, another item that we've just have needed to do some work on. Up Back up at the community center, uh, there's a, or in town at the community center, rather, there's a retaining wall that, that just needs some work. It's starting to fail a little bit. One in the back, right? Yes, sir. We talked about exactly. it. Exactly. Exactly. That's the one exactly. Uh, we have some energy saving measures on this page you're going to see there are two energy saving measures these were developed uh, in coordination with San Mateo County Energy Watch project and with PG&E they came in and did a rather detailed study and what we selected out of those was a number of projects that had a payback period of three to seven years and the beauty of these is that they're all going to be once we've paid for them uh, PG&E will then reimburse us and then we can do on bill financing payback for it at zero percent interest so it's a pretty good deal <clears throat> under the uh, the recreation facilities that's going to be at the community center mission blue the sunrise room the library and primarily what we're doing there you can see the cost is not very much but we're upgrading the exiting signs from incandescents to leds we're putting in seven day programmable thermostats and we're weatherizing the exterior doors all things that make good sense and the things you would generally do in your house i guess except for the exit signs i don't know anybody that has those at their home um Community center handrail. This is a very popular project, <clears throat> so we hope to put that in, get was it done. The, wasn't that on the last slide? Uh, no, ma'am. That was there was a rub rail at Mission Blue, I believe, on the last side. Oh, that was okay. the chair rail, right? So this is the retaining wall. This is next to the retaining wall. This leads you when you come out of where the seniors have lunch and you try and get up into the new garden. It, it gives you a handhold on there. So that's what we're talking about there. Painting of the fire station exterior, it's a darndest thing. If you don't paint wooden structures, they just start to get really dry run on it. And I'm, this one really absolutely needs to be done very soon. The building is is going to start sinking <clears throat> if we don't do that. Also, of course, once we get up there on the roof and started looking at the HVAC units as we were starting to recommission the building and get it back into service, we found out that a lot of those units that are original uh, are starting to show their age. They're starting to rust. They fail on a pretty irregular basis we have a plumber go out there and having to restart them up and we've had the hvac maintenance people go out there and work on it so they've they've reached their time i did try and get the energy watch people to do it but they just couldn't squeeze that into one of their programs so we tried um the last energy yes sir ask a question of course to that. um one of the things that of course we that accomplished last year was the re-roofing and mm -hmm. hopefully the waterproofing of the exterior sure. um, and one of the consequences of the problems we had in the past was the existence of mold and my question is what kind of ongoing maintenance monitoring do we have to make sure that the mold isn't there doesn't reappear how do we check in that to make sure we're okay well, the primary thing we're doing is by the people who are living there looking to see if we're getting water intrusion because you're not having water intrusion you're not going to have mold development the mold that was there was completely removed stripped down to the bare wood sanitized and then encapsulated afterwards and then every and then all the sheathing and such is put back so the occupants are always our first indicator to make sure we're not getting any wet we're also doing an annual roofing inspection on the building they were, so we're pretty. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <coughs> no, sorry. Uh, we're, we're pretty confident that uh, everything was removed and that it's not going to come back again unless there's some more water. Absolutely. We did uh, detailed testing 
on that. We did detailed mold, mold spore testing, and the way we did it is we went in and in three or four different locations, we took air mold samples before we started the test. And then we had the contractor go in and set up his vis queen because he had to set up a negative pressurized containment area. We did mold spore samples then inside and outside his area. And the reason we were doing them outside the area is because I wanted to make sure he had kept his negative containment working because if he made a mess and the molds got outside, that was going to be his problem. Mm -hmm. And then we did the testing afterwards. And the first testing failed. Mm. So the contractor had to come back, had to redo it, and then we did the retesting. And then when we did the final retest, we retested the whole station. It all met all of the indoor air quality standards, and it's just fine. Mm -hmm. So we're pretty satisfied. We're pretty confident that's not going to happen. And again, it's just really a matter of you keep the water out then you're not going to have a mold problem. Okay. okay. Good. The, the reason I ask is that when they had the open house at mm -hmm. the fire station, I was asking some of the you know, old-timers in the fire department about the, you know, what their experience was and what they knew about this and so forth. And, and they were fairly uninformed. <laughs> uh, so I was kind of surprised. And so I just, uh, so I promised that I would inquire. Okay, sure. To make sure that uh, everything is going to be safe for them. So that's obviously the most important objective. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, well, yeah we're not going to, we don't want to put, nobody wants to put someone in a condition where their, you know, their health is at risk. That's okay. okay. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so then we have the, the last energy saving measures. I'm sorry, did you have a question? I didn't. I, I was going to follow up on that. I thought when we did the um, revitalization of the firehouse that when they were talking about it, they were going to come back in in six months or at uh, specific periods to do retesting. So my, my question was somewhat answered by, um, by your response to and, and this certainly question. If there was, and if somebody had a burning desire to do that, you could. It's just yeah. but commission the air quality tech to come back in and take some. I know at one point we talked about putting moisture sensors in there, but mm -hmm. that didn't. Uh, yeah, it just it really is not <clears throat> very feasible for the type of roofing that we have. Yeah. I mean, in the walls. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay, continue. Okay, thank you. So <clears throat> the energy saving measures, in this case, at City Hall and the fire station, what we're doing here at City Hall is we're just optimizing this water source heat pump system that we have. It's the control system that really needs a little tweaking. We're trying to make sure that it's really operating at the lowest energy consumption that it can. And at Station 81, what we're talking about doing there is upgrading all of the existing incandes and the, the incandescent the fluorescent lamps that they have. They're still working on T12 lamps. So we're going over to T8 lamps and putting uh, the compact fluorescent. The project looks a little pricey, and there's a specific reason for that because there's an unknown challenge that we have there. One of the things that happens in the fire station is that all of their lights are tied to the alerting system. So if, you, if you've ever been over at the fire station and you hear the ring down and you get the call up that, you know, Station 81 you're, you know, or Engine 81, you're being sent out, all the lights come on. All the lights come on, the gas stove automatically shuts off, the door opens, all that kind of thing happens automatically. And we need to make sure that whatever we do with the change out of the fluorescent bulbs and ballast, that continues to work because you don't want the firefighters to be there in the middle of the night and the lights not come on to wake them up, right, when they're, they're getting sent out to, a, to an accident or a fire or something along those lines. So it's a, it's a little more expensive, but I, I think it's over the long run. It's, it's time and effort well spent. Uh, one of our favorite projects, we've talked about this for a long time, a, a concept plan about establishing a pedestrian walkway from Tulare all the way down to Alvarado. Uh, the Bicentennial Walkway, this is a project that's been in my CIP list for 13 years. To, uh, to replace the railings and to put some, we didn't put the words in here, but vandal-proof bollards because <laughs> we just have some people that love to destroy those. I don't know why that is, but they do. Um, putting a pool canvas shade in, this is just giving people a little more shade for those people who, uh, who don't, <clears throat> who can't find a spot underneath the solar panel that we have. <clears throat> Resurfacing, replastering, and retiling the pool floor, this is pretty important maintenance that we need to do on the pool now. Again, it's one of those capital items we've had that we just haven't had the, uh, the funds to do some maintenance on, so we're going to need to do that. Still on the pool. Yes, sir. Just, uh, I'm thinking about the bollards, the, you know, the light standards along the walkways, which when they were first installed, the vendor claimed that they were vandal proof, and you see how false that was. Um, that was 30 years ago. Uh -huh. <laughs> Things changed. Kids have gotten yeah. tougher. So <laughs> <Technology's> <laughs> gotten better for kids. Uh, but anyway, because I, I, I remember one of the residents who lives there was uh, observed on one occasion uh, 
a teenage boy with a two by four just walking up the walkway yeah. and swinging as hard as he could at every one of them. Yeah. Um, I'm just trying to figure out is, is there anything we can do to kind of reduce that kind of behavior and I don't know what the heck it would be and I guess with the police department sitting here uh, it's relevant uh, and whether there was some kind of signage that would you know help or you know, parents are responsible I don't know but um, I mean it, just the wanton vandalism is just unbelievable that some people engage in and I don't know whether there's anything more we can do but if there is, we're going to spend all this money. We sure help, don't want to see it you know, destroyed in the first year or two. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> it's frustrating as all get out uh, <laughs> to put things out and have them destroyed like that. It really is. This is. I know that while you were gone, you had a, some conversations about uh, the health and safety subcommittee and some of the pedestrian walkways. At one point in time, we had nine or ten of those yield to pedestrian signs up everywhere throughout town, and some night, some jackwad decided to run over and run them all down just because. You know, and that was, you know, $5,000 worth of material destroyed just because they could. And, you know, that's a very, very small percentage of a population, but it drives you a little goofy. And, you know, I look just like there's a lot of things that drive us a little goofy, right? You know, for me, litter on the streets, things that people have seen out. But, <clears throat> you know, how much how much of your effort can you really put to that? How many, how many cameras do we put up everywhere until we start to look like downtown London, I guess, where there's a camera <laughs> on every corner and, you know, that's how we start to analyze it. I, I, I don't. That, that, that's a tough thing. I, I am just as frustrated as you are by it. I think in this case, it's uh, it's probably going to be okay as long as we replace these these bollards with concrete fixtures. It's going to be a, you know, require some real effort. But you know, certainly, it's kind of the philosophy I use with locks. I've never had things stolen when I've had a lock on it. So the the perspective is that a lock keeps generally honest people generally honest. But somebody who really wanted to get into my stuff. Could have used bolt cutters and got to it. Mm -hmm. So you can make devices and you can set things up so that they generally encourage people to have good behavior. But there's going to be a jerk every now and then that's going to come along, and that's part of what my staff does is we repair things that, that people break, sometimes intentionally, sometimes accidentally. And the police department has to make a report on it. <laughs> and sometimes when we're really lucky, they catch them. That's, and that's really the good thing. And I know they've caught people in acts of vandalism, and we've had people go out and repaint stuff and do things, and that's great. And I've got to tell you, usually my experience is oftentimes when the parents know about it, they're just as embarrassed as anybody else. They're just as mad as you and I are about it. You know, they, they're like, are you kidding me? You did what? And they want their parents to go out. That's not every case. I know the, the police have to deal with some other people where they're, the parents may have taught that behavior in their children in some cases, but that's a really, really small percentage of the population. So I think we do what we can and, and try and go through it. Yeah. I don't know if that, that, I don't think that satisfactorily answers it. I just, I guess I'm just expressing empathy with your position. Yeah. <laughs> One suggestion you might want to do is, you know, there's those neighborhood watch signs um, that you see sometimes. And, you know, I never really thought about what they meant until someone explained it to me that it's, it means that, you know, your neighbors that you are supposed to, watch out for anything that's going on that's suspicious and then report it. And so, you know, if, if it gets vandalized again, we might want to consider putting up a neighborhood watch sign by those walkways and informing the neighbors who live around there that that's a specific issue to look out for. That's Certainly a kid walking up with a two-by-four. Yeah. Baseball bats were the old ones used to get them, too. Yeah. Just yeah. It, it, it almost seems that the more you put a sign up, the more it gives... <laughs> them the idea to do what you've just put a sign up to not do and yeah, that's there is saying. no yeah. you know accounting for why people will do those kind of things mm -hmm. but it's almost as if it gives them the idea to yeah. do it, it yeah. there is some weird mechanism that occasionally goes on there i've seen that when a previous employment in a water district where we had a relatively dangerous vault area that we didn't want people to get to and it's kind of out in the middle of nowhere and if you fell into this one piece of it, you got sucked into this eight-foot aqueduct, and then that became a pipe, and not a good day for you. But people wanted to go out there because it was out in the middle of nowhere, so it didn't matter. Well, we'd put locks on it. We'd change things. People would go in. I mean, one time we, we could tell. Somebody had gone out and dragged an oxyacetylene torch, you know, a couple hundred yards through the woods and got in there and partied and, you know, spray painted. Ha-ha, we got in on it. and It was mm -hmm. just kind of ridiculous. We finally got to the point where we track walked in this giant concrete slab with this huge excavator and plopped it on top of it there move that and that stopped it but it was just mm -hmm. counterproductive at that point it's when you leave the lock off the lock off and you say 
Okay. Speaking of vandalism, I had one question. So on Quarry Road, there's that, I don't know what it is, but I thought it was like an earthquake measurement device. It's something that's... It's a bollard. A bollard, yeah. And I always would see it vandalized, and it would be replaced, and it would be vandalized again. You know, if someone would just take something it's to it. to and keep vehicles out. Okay. Is what you're talking no, about. No, is that what that was green. for? Okay. No, no, it's an earthquake sensing device that's, that's part right. of the... Down by the end, all the way down by the quarry? It's on Quarry Road, um, just as you get past Lippman and you get to where the trucks make the turn. Is that yeah, right? Past the bar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's, it. That's a USGS. Right. Mm -hmm. So who is responsible for USGS. maintaining that? Okay. So and you can actually go and look at the site and see it jiggle when it's right. jiggling. You know, you can <laughs> somebody on. sitting on it? No, no, no. I mean, <laughs> the, what, the, what it's measuring. Uh -huh. you, you can look at the points that they have um, on their measurement devices. Oh, okay. Great. Okay, but if it gets vandalized, um, Not us. okay. Not so us. You have to contact USGS. Yeah, it's okay. yeah, that challenge. All right. So I think we hit that. Um, so this is the gazebo, the, uh, the metal gazebo that we have at the pool. That, as you can tell, if you've been there lately, it's getting pretty rusted. It needs yeah. some work. And you can also see that the concrete is starting to spall a little bit. Uh, across the pool, so we need to we need to work on that as well. Uh, the gateway entrance. This is the project where we've talked about. If you are coming into town across Tunnel Avenue Bridge, right on the right hand side, there's that open area where we've tried to plant some trees and sort of keep the weeds down a little bit. But this this is providing enough money so we can put some sort of vegetation there. The original concept that we're working with and that we're working with a consultant on is to come up with a native planting. But that's what this was, would allow is that us to put in a native planning, get it established, and then because it's native, hopefully not have to water it. So that's what this project is. And this is one of the, uh, the two projects that you will not find uh, listed in one of the departments. This is a new one, right? I'm sorry, sir? This is a new one. It, well, it's a new one, and it just it didn't get into one of the departments, but it's, so it's here. Um, so here we go. These are, these are the non-general uh, fund type projects. The light on Lagoon Way, there's been a conversation about whether we need some lighting at the intersection of Lagoon Way and Sierra Point Parkway. We've got a number in there as a placeholder right now. The, really the biggest challenge we have out there is we don't have electricity there. We don't have electricity that we can access. The, there is a, a, uh, a traffic control management station that Caltrans has out there. And they've dragged power all the way from, there's a PG&E transformer in front of the corporation yard. And they placed it along Lagoon Way, but we can't access it because it's, it was just size for them. So we're going to have to get power out there. That makes it an expensive project, so I think we're probably going to want to sit down and have some conversations about, you know, what the problem is and what it is we're really trying to accomplish and see if there's maybe, you know, a, a different way that we can get to the same end. Do you think that you could partner with one of the <coughs> private property there where you can tie into their source? There's, there's nobody out there, sir. Right. This is, this is out of Lagoon Way and Sierra Point Parkway. It's up at where you get on 101. Oh, uh, okay. All right. Randy, last year at, at the league conference, I saw some pretty nice um, solar-driven lights. Right. Um, that's something we could look at, too? I, that That's kind of what I'm thinking about. I'm, yeah. I'm trying to – I need to sit down and ascertain what, what, the, what the problem is. If the problem is that people can't see the stop signs or yeah. if they need more advanced warning. But th we have a couple of those solutions up there. We've got the one, if you're coming down Guadalupe, coming back towards Mission Blue, mm -hmm. there's that advanced warning sign because you're kind of on a curve. So that's set up so that you know that a, uh, a traffic signal is going to be ahead of you. So something like that might work, something that's just, you know, as simple as, you know, a flashing red light underneath a stop sign that lights it up all on a PV panel. Of course, the only challenge we're going to have with PV panels, we just talked about, about vandalism, is I'm going to have to put it up on a 15-foot pole. Because all these people come along and steal them. Well, the, one, the ones that Clark's talking about, I, I said there was a whole booth dedicated to that, and, and they were up on top of the pole. Right. They were really nice. Well, the panels will be. It's just a question. Then you got to bring the light down to where you want. Right. But that's what you do. Because we've actually had the, the PV panels that have been stolen, the ones that we had when we did the Safe Routes to School mm -hmm. years ago, and we put um, some crossing signals at South Hill. Right. Somebody went up and stole those, so we put in a bigger pole, so they <laughs> replaced the panel. No matter of how how high up a pole can you shinny, I guess I need to put bear grease on it or something. Well, it's also the light there. I mean, <clears throat> I'm not sure there's going to be much we can do besides a full-on signal to alert people to the four-way to the three-way stop sign there. Um, but I think that 
whatever we do, we need to be careful of causing a big light standard out there to be a visible from light noise town. Yes. From the free right, right, man, from the freeway, from the lagoon. I, I agree. So I mean, so maybe we can look. We I think with this amount of money, we can look at photovoltaics. We can look at putting three-way intersection signs. We make it a little clearer. I mean, it certainly is dark. Mm -hmm. If you don't know where you're coming into Brisbane, the first time you see that, it is kind of off-putting in the dark. It's a little whoa, where am I? So we could. I, I'm sure there's something we can do to improve it a little bit. <clears throat> so I asked. Um, maybe this answers that question: whether or not. Uh, the Sierra Point Lighting Atlantic Landscape District went up that far. Um, they do. And, but then there's some question as to whether there is a funding mechanism that's feasible there, since that fund, I guess, is in deficit, as I recall. That's correct. Last conversation. No, actually, at this point in time, we've raised rates high enough that they are um, in balance. The reserves are positive going in for 14-15. In 13, 14, they're negative. Uh -huh. They're positive in 14, 15. At the end, you know, June 30th, 2015, unless you do this project, <laughs> then they'll be slightly negative. <laughs> okay. But we are collecting more than enough to offset the full cost of the ongoing maintenance. So we will be able to begin to build up a reserve to be able to do capital projects and to do replacement as we need them without having to increase rates specifically for those. So it wouldn't be in the utility fund? It would no, be it would be in the, well, the Sierra, yes. Right. It would be in the Sierra Point, and that's why it's not enclosed within the utility fund bracket. Okay. Good. Thank you. Sure. So some of the other projects we're looking at doing, drought contingency plan. Most water agencies will have a drought contingency plan already, and part of the reason for that is because they're required to do an urban water management plan. Because of our size, the two districts, we're never, we've never been required to do that, so we don't have an, a UWMP, if you will. Uh, certainly with, with the drought that we've got going on, it, it strikes me that it makes a lot of sense now to start to really analyze that and to look at what sort of options we can do and what sort of things we can put into play. So that's why that there is there. The next two plans, our current water and sewer master plans are circa 2003. So normally you replace those every 10 years. I think it's important to have those for us to get them updated to understand the current conditions. And certainly to have those as a solid base will be a good thing to have in the event that any project might be approved out at the Baylands because then we will know what the existing conditions, the existing capacities of our system are so we can make sure that whatever projects the developer is going to be required to do are really projects that are not going to have a negative impact on our system. So he'll take care of both his system and not have a negative impact on our system as well. Sierra Point Road sewer main well, replacement. Yes, sir, go ahead. Just comment. Mm -hmm. uh, um, as we all know, one of the complications, though, in the Baylands is the Bayshore Sanitary District. Of course. So I don't know how we deal with that, but that becomes a problem in any kind of master plan. Um, it doesn't pose that much of a challenge for me, sir, to do a master plan because we just assume the existing boundaries are what the existing boundaries are. And what that allows us to do is then we just understand our backbone, our infrastructure, where our system is. And if there were any other areas that were not currently within our boundaries that happen to be incorporated, that happen to be added <laughs> to us, then we just, what we're analyzing is their impact on our infrastructure. But, um if we wanted to do some kind of, you know, integrated wastewater, potable water kind of system, uh, doesn't the division between different uh, districts create a planning problem? Uh, well, it could. It. it, it seems that for me to really answer that question, we've got to sit down and really see what, what the, the paradigms we'd be working are. What, you know, what <coughs> questions do we assume are underlying? What are we trying to do? I would suggest that if we're trying to do out there, for instance, if we're, if we're talking about at the Baylands and if we're talking about doing recycled water, there are challenges in doing that. And, and if we presume that Bayshore Sanitary is going to continue to be the, the sanitary sewers provider, there would. But there are models throughout the state where that has been done before. I've worked with them before where you have 
two joint agencies that own a wastewater treatment plant, and then they agreed to get together with another party that created a recycled water plant, and those parties then sold it to the water service providers that were provided in the area, and they moved the water along and through. And it can be done. So is it a challenge? Sure. Is it is it something that's an obstacle that can't be overcome? I don't think so. If there are willing parties, just about anything can be can be worked out. Okay, thanks. Yes, sir. Uh, the next project on there, Sierra Point Road sewer main replacement. We've got a section of uh, on Sierra Point Road where we've just had way too many challenges and, and a couple of blockages, and we would really rather get in there. Sewer is just one of those things, I think, as the council is well aware. When we find out that we've got areas where we've got bad pipe and it's city pipe, we need to go in and fix it. I don't think that we should be subjecting our citizens to, to sanitary sewer overflows or, or backages. What part of Sierra Point is that? So it's the, like, near the 400, 500 block. That's the section where we're struggling. Okay. Kind of where we had a slide a couple years ago from Humboldt. Down right there, in the middle that of town. Kind of area. Mm. No, that's the 600 block, isn't it, sir? Yeah, yeah you're right. Yeah. Um, sewer camera. Um, our sewer camera is a little old and pokey and... <laughs> doesn't let us see the things we'd like to do, and unfortunately, it's just one more of those capital things we need to purchase. Uh, Clean the lens. It's got crap all over it. Really? <laughs> 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 it's the damnedest thing, sir. It really is. <laughs> yeah, I don't, you couldn't pay me enough to do that job, <laughs> really. That's, that's a, that takes a special breed of worker to do that. Last item is a boat. Marina needs a boat. current boat we have is dead in the water. It, uh, it floats, but, but that's all it does. We got to the point where we went out and spent $4,000 on a little rubberized dinghy so we could have something out there. But we particularly need the boat because one of the bigger items that we're going to be bringing to you in the fall is dredging. So we're going to come back to you and we're going to talk to you about having to raise the rates so we can cover the cost of bonding, and we're going to bring you a contract uh, with the designer to do the dredging. But you can't move people's boats without a boat. And... We need a work boat, and we need a real work boat. Uh, we've, we've gone through and spec this. I, I think I've been really fortunate that the young man we have down there right now it happens to be a boat driver by trade from the Coast Guard. That's what he does. And this particular boat that we spec'd out is a boat that he has experience with. It's very, very capable in shallow water, which is typically what you see in the marinas. We're only talking about six to eight foot of clearance, but it's also competent enough to go out to our last mile marker or even a little further out into the bay if we needed to provide assistance to someone. That is the cost of it, fully equipped. Uh, I, I do want to tell you that we are putting in for a grant, and we are hoping to get a, a matching federal grant, so that I hope that the cost will be half of that, that, that we'll only pay 50% on it, but I can't guarantee it, so I've I've listed the full price of it in there. From boat and waterways? or uh, I'm sorry? Boat and waterways, have you? I'm, I'm California sure. boat and waterways grant? Is it? No, this is a Department of Homeland Security grant. Oh, okay. This is a Department of Homeland Security grant. So I've I've talked with the chief of police, and you know we've said, could we make a reasonable argument uh, that we could make that boat available for uh, for a PD response if we needed to? And sort of the the setup that we have right now is what we were thinking is that we would have marina staff be the boat drivers if we ever needed to and that way the police officers don't have to be trained to operate the boat but they would be so the marina staff would be chauffeur the chauffeur yes thank you <laughs> thank you the, the chauffeur um and there's a pretty good argument to be made for that i mean there's not really law enforcement close at all out there I and mean, we have we have had a couple of incidents where we just don't have a boat to respond this is something that has come up in conversations that I've been having with some of our people out at the marina, and um, it seems, I have no idea what, what you've spec'd here, but it seems like a lot of boat for what we normally need. Um, most of the marinas have a small tender type boat that can do pretty much anything out to the first mile marker with with what we get thrown with. So um, if we don't get matching, I'm not sure we would. Uh, and again, I haven't seen what you've spec'd out, but it seems like a lot of money for, for what we are required to have. I, well, you know, ma'am, I'm certainly I'm relying on the expertise of 
of somebody who's who's done this for a living and that's his professional background. So I, I'm I'm in no position to dis, to, to really discuss it. I mean, I've certainly gone through it and over it with him, but it, it strikes me that it's this is not an unreasonable uh, vessel that we're looking at. Okay. So, well, it'd be a nice boat. Oh, it'd be a nice boat. It would be a nice boat. It's a twin engine boat. It would have the capability. Uh, certainly, certainly would should have way more capabilities than we would need um, for moving people or to getting them in inside the marina for safe harbor. Um, but again, yeah. I don't. It's not a time to talk about technic technical issues here, but uh, it's a lot of money and a lot of boat. It's a lot of money, and I would suggest that it's the right amount of boat. You just you know, we we have sixty foot power boats out there that we need to move. Mm -hmm. uh, we are out there working in occasionally relatively rough sea conditions when we're trying to work on those mile markers. That is not something you want to try and do on a, on a vessel that's under twenty foot. And I don't think it's something that you really want to do with a single engine vessel. I mean, yeah, there are people that can do it. If you if you were just going to have a harbor boat, yeah, you could have a smaller vessel than that. But we don't live just in the harbor, and we really do have to move. Uh, vessels around and we do it on a regular basis anyway for people but certainly when we're doing the dredging it's something that's going to happen all the time we're going to be we're going to be playing uh where's my boat when people come back in on the weekend or so where did you move me to what slip am i in now okay thank you sure. sir so since you brought up dredging um where are we going to deal with that or how are we going to deal with that financially could uh I know we've talked about this before, but it isn't in the list here, and, and there's probably a reason for that. So it would be nice to air that since there's been some voters already expressing some concern about why is it taking us so long. As you I mean, know, if you don't get the grant? Uh, no. Well, if you don't get the grant? No, it's not. So it's, it's not, that's not a grant issue, sir. So I, what we're going to have to do for that. That's going to be a it's it's going to be pretty expensive. call it a three million dollar project. Yeah, right. Let's let's just say it's oh, three million dollars. Dredging. Oh, the dredging. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. so if I understand correctly, Stewart's plan is that uh, we're going to issue bonds for that, and that when you issue bonds, you have to show that you can cover the, the cost of the <coughs> bonds. Right now, our marina is twenty to twenty five percent by twenty to twenty five percent the cheapest marina around. So we are two standard deviations away from the median price, and I don't. And I, and I suspect, you know, that, that there's a couple of reasons why that hasn't been done. Some of them we haven't been doing the dock repair. Some of them are, you know, our, our depths are starting to get a little shallow. That makes sense to me. But before we would issue those bonds, we would come to you and we would ask uh, for a rate increase to cover those bonds. So that's how it would be covered. Okay. So. Um, Am I right, Stu? All right. Okay. It would Thank be you. In, um, it would have to be in the marina budget, uh, the debt service. Yes. Um, and there would be, you know, a certain amount per year to, to handle right. that. Right. So you figure a three a three million dollar bond would be probably somewhere in the three hundred, depending on how many years you want to do it. So one of the questions will be how long the dredging will last for, because right. you don't, you know, again, getting back to the issue with bonds, you don't want the bonds to outlast the project. Right. So if you figure it's a fifteen to twenty year dredging period of time, you're probably talking maybe somewhere between three hundred to four hundred thousand dollars a year in bond cost um, so what we would need to do is look at a way to have an available three to four hundred thousand dollars in revenues and until we get that three to four hundred thousand dollars in revenues we're not going to be able to show a bond buyer the ability to, to pay for it so until we get the council to approve the overall plan for the dredging and the overall plan for the financing it doesn't you know, it's speculative at this point as to what that will ultimately look like. So we would bring back the whole plan of what it costs to dredge, what the rate increase would be, and then what the bond rates would be, what the bond payments would be, and that would all then be as an amendment to whatever budget at that time. It would be a significant rate increase with 500 and whatever slips we have. Well, we get about $1.4 million in revenues a year, and you're talking probably about a quarter of that. Right. That's a significant amount. Well, I'm talking about eight hundred, seven to eight hundred dollars a year per slip <coughs> on average. I mean, uh, right. So until you know, until that's all approved, um, it's we can't put. It would be without you approving 
the rate increase, it would be difficult for us to put the expense in because we can't afford the expense until we have a rate increase in. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're waiting until the overall. So that's why it's not in this budget. That's why it's not in this that's budget. That's why it's not in this budget. Right, plus we missed a window of uh, dredging, too. Right? That, that was why we did not bring the rate increase and the issuance of bonds to you earlier this year. We just got too close where we were, we were going to have such a small window that it did not seem to, to be worth it to rush. Whereas if we start in October, we're pretty confident that we'll be able to start at the beginning of the dredging season in June and then be able to press forward. But, you know, when the, it's always a challenge to raise rates. Mm -hmm. If you don't raise rates, you're not going to get the dredging, and what do we do then? What, what kind of time frame do you think, Randy, when you'll have that before the council? October. In October. October this year, yes, sir. Okay. And, and we're confident that we could get a permit and get the um, approval for the material to take out in time for the... That's what the consultant has told me, yes, ma'am. That's why we schedule it for that date. We had that conversation with them when we, when we realized we were going to make the window this year. And have the voters, uh, are they picking up on, you know, the potential rate increase? Um, I haven't tried to rub that into anyone right now. <laughs> just Well, just because there's a certain reality is that if you've got a, if you've got a deep keeled sailboat, you have to watch the tide tables out there because if you don't watch the tide tables, you'll be stuck. Mm -hmm. You won't be able to get out or come in. If you have a big power boat that sits low in the water, you have to proceed very slowly. When, when you don't have uh, very much tide on you because otherwise you will suck mud into your intake and you'll really follow your engines. So under those conditions and knowing that it's going to be almost a year before I can fix that, I haven't told anybody that, well, you know, I'm going to raise your rates and you're going to live with the, the tide the way it is now. Uh, so I haven't. And that's why. Mm -hmm. It just seems like that would be poking a hornet's nest for no very good reason. And, and if you remember from last year we t when we were talking about this project, what we had said that we wanted to get some of the docks repaired prior to looking at the dredging project because we wanted to show some progress on some of the issues that the boaters had talked about before we started looking at rate increases. So that's also part of the reason, I think, why we're beyond everything else. That was part of also what we had said last year. And it's also showing that docks are in good shape before the dredging starts. That way, if right. something gets damaged, I mean, and this was the this was the conversations we were having last year when we were talking about this that we wanted to make sure that we were that you know council wanted to make sure that the docks repairs were going had been going on and were showing progress before we started the rate increase process. Yeah, that makes sense. It's it's not not to skew off too much on this, but. Um, We've done some sonar so, or readings or whatever. Oh, yes, sure, yeah. absolutely. Uh, is the worst of the problem like in Dock 1, 2 area? Yes. Or is it flat? It's, it actually It doesn't seem to me it's all the way across. It, that and the approach. Yeah. It's, the, it's, the, it's the approach where we've got the problems. In fact, to, to, regardless of which way you're going, it's on your starboard side. Mm -hmm. it's, if you're going out, it's on the right. If you're coming back in, it's on the right. You've got to kind of stay the middle course. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple of spots as you're going out where you've got a, you've got a couple of little humps. So what we really need is somebody with a big barge to be dragged through there and kind of level, <laughs> level it out for us for a little bit. But, you know, unfortunately, people do it with their keels occasionally, and that's always a little bit of a surprise. Yeah, but, I mean, it being that being that part, and that's probably more due to tidal action than, you know, surface dirt coming across. Oh, I think so, absolutely. And we've had a long run. We've had over 15 years on this right. dredging project. That's there are marinas that dredge every three years, so we've had a pretty good run. It's it's been a good thing. Well, my question is the methodology. Uh, does the whole marina need to be done? Yes, it does. Okay, it does absolutely. Yeah, the the worst part is up front and at the approach, but the whole marina does mm. need to be done. Because I haven't had issues. I haven't been out in two years. But I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and we thank you for paying your slip fee, sir. Um, on on that note. Um, it is a problem for many boaters that I know and not even people with, with deep keels and on multiple docks that I've been hearing about it. And I think that to look at the future boating boaters paying the entire cost um, in their rate increase of the entire bond is going to be a little bit um, difficult because we have been um, sort of robbing Peter to pay Paul by not doing 
the maintenance or or allowing for the maintenance you know we've been taking <coughs> profits out of the marina um, and repaying some of our debt um, in lieu of doing some of the na of the necessary maintenance and so I think that it might be difficult to put the entire cost of the dredging on the current and future tenants when that has been being diverted for several years and it may need to be more flexible where it's not 100% coming from rate increases. All right, ma'am, we'll take that on board. We'll, we'll consider that as we bring it to you. Uh, before you do, Stuart, I'd, I'd like to hear your comment on that. Uh, yeah, this, as we talked about at the very beginning of the budget process, that this is an enterprise fund. Normally, you would anticipate enterprise funds to be self-funding. You know, at one point in time, we were using uh, we combined the marina and the Parks and Recreation Department into a single fund. Um, so there was some money that was being put aside that was being used from the marina to pay for Parks and Recreation programs. Um, that has been split since then. So there is, you know, we, but we've never really gone through and used marina money for depreciation. So one of the challenges that we had up until the year 2005, 2002, when we refunded the original RDA debt was any excess money from the marina was supposed to be used to pay for bond payments. So we weren't really running excess revenues up until that point in time when we refinanced the debt because anything we did run should have been used to pay off the RDA debt. Uh, so at, in 2002, we then combined, based on council direction, we combined the Parks and Recreation Department and the marina as more of the recreational op opportunities. And yeah, the marina runs and ran above operational f numbers and then the Recreation Department ran below, but if you remember that RDA debt is being paid for by um, general by the taxpayers, and I think what the City Council was saying at that point in time, that the $2 million pay debt payment paying for by RDA and therefore taxpayers was a benefit to the marina um, people, that they did not have to pay for the beginning cost of the marina. And so I think council said that recognizing that, then it was, it made sense to use some of the money because it wasn't up to the $2 million payment number from the marina to pay for other services within the city. So it's a, it's a question of how do you want to look at that in the, you know, from past issues? And then going forward, the question is how do we best structure a bond, a debt payment to pay for a necessary repair and who should be paying for it. So when you pay for it out of future revenue, you're paying the people who are actually getting the benefit, as we talked about before, are paying for that. And still none of the none of the marina residents or boat owners are paying for the original cost of the marina. Because if we were to try to put a two million dollar bond payment on the boat owners, that would not be a twenty five percent increase. It would be a hundred and 25, 150% increase on the marina users. So it's a question, I mean, it's, a, it's you get back into that philosophical question that, you know, we've had before as to how do you really pay for um, services? How do you really pay for um, future improvements? And, uh, you know, there's no one right answer. And it's just trying to piece everything together as to what the city council considers what the important issues are today that we want to pay for and what are the important issues going forward that we want to pay for and how do we make all that work gets back to the question that you know cliff and i were discussing monday night i'm not going to get into it again but on that priority based budgeting kinds of questions as to you know what are what is important for the city to do and how do we pay for everything that we need to get done so that would be my response Another non-response to your question, Clark. I'm working. I'm working hard on these. Well, it's not. It's not a non-response. I don't think it's just you know kind of helps with background and educational thing too. You know, and just how all this falls. And so, I mean, it's good information, really. 
against uh, speaking of the historical um, I mean uh, the original conception way back in the, in the 70s and the reason that the uh, cost of the marina was shared by all the property owners current and presumably forthcoming and all the buildings that were going to uh, uh, prop up all over Sierra Point which still haven't popped up but uh, the idea was that by having a marina there, it gave the Sausalito feel, and that would enhance the whole area, uh, and it would make it a more desirable place to, to work, and people could, you know, rent the facilities there uh, at, at a much higher level, or at a level that certainly was, was better than some other places, because this had a, you know, wonderful ambience of the, of the marina and, and, that, and the, quote, Sausalito feel, that phrase was used over and over again. Mm -hmm. And so that's why the expense was shared throughout the whole Sierra Point. I mean, there was a philosophical decision made that we're re one of the reasons we're doing this is to enhance the development of the entire Sierra Point area. And that's why the, all the property owners were expected to participate in that. So there was a deliberate decision to do that, and that was the reason why. Yeah, and South Beach Harbor in San Francisco was built with uh, California Boat and Waterways uh, grant, from what I understand. So is that something that we can apply for for the dredging is a possibility? I'm just saying, you know. I don't know. Maybe, I don't know the answer to that, sir. Yeah. I mean, I'm just throwing an idea out there. Well, certainly as we go forward with this, we're going to yeah. look for yeah. other funding opportunities, absolutely. I mean, this is in, in response to, to Terry's concern, too, you know, about, you know, all of a sudden people getting, you know, this, you know, because we are going to lose people, no doubt, you know, that you're paying for it and don't, you know, there's going to be somewhat, and, and I won't predict how big, but there will be somewhat of an exodus once, you know, I mean, because. Oh, there will be an exodus just because we are dredging, just because it's a, a little bit of bump, you know, mayhem. You're talking, right. You're right, but I think we're still going to be below the average. Yeah. And I, I quite frankly, and we're going to have an above average marina. Yeah. I, I think we've got a good marina down there. We are working on having the right environment. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really phase anybody that we don't have a fuel station because they can just motor across and, and go to Oyster Cove and pick it up. I think people would probably like to see maybe one or two amenities, but yes. they're pretty simple. You know, if you had a hot dog stand every now and then, I think for the most part would be good, and the Yacht Club seems to take care of that. On a pretty regular basis, people like that marina. It's quite peaceful, and that's what they like about it. And quite frankly, the people like that we're doing the dock improvements, but most people are like, wow, you know, I was the other marina I was at was way worse than this, and they weren't doing anything about it. So we, we do a pretty decent job down there. We've got new restrooms. Still in San board, Leandro. Looking good. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's a decent marina. Yeah, you know, I, I like the strategy that you guys have put forth. I think, um, you know, letting the boat owners know that we are – Listening to them, we're making these improvements. Sure, they're not going to like uh, when the rates go up, but it's for a reason. And, and you know, people will, will pay if they feel like they're getting something in return. I mean, I get a lot of comments, and most people who, you know, use their boats a lot are willing to have increased costs for better access and better docks. Um, not to say that everyone is of that ilk, but um, we have a really good feeling down at this marina, and we have a good community. And I think that's a really important thing to have. Thanks. And thank you. Because we're working really hard at that. I mean, we really are. We're really trying to make sure that, you know, it's probably in, over the last year or so, we've, we've suggested to a number of people that maybe they would be happier at other marinas. Um, because they just weren't a good fit in our marina. You know, some of the, the way the people were conducting themselves uh, were not conducive to having what I, what I always refer to it as a family environment. I always say, you know what, somebody ought to feel comfortable bringing his family down here and just sitting on his boat any day of the week, any weekend, and just having a little barbecue. And there shouldn't be, you know, loud blurring music going on. There shouldn't be inappropriate language. There shouldn't be stuff strewn on the docks. It should be it should feel like a nice safe environment it doesn't mean it's only catering to families but it's just that's kind of the standard we're trying to set and we work real hard at that and we we try to encourage the boaters to to understand that, that that this is the type of environment we want if you want to party and do that all night long well probably ought to go somewhere else 
Go to Oyster Point. <laughs> no. Short haul. <laughs> if you can make it, unlike that kind of barrel boat that didn't quite make it all the way over there. Well, I'm out of slides, so um, okay. I'm, I'm happy to take whatever questions you have, or otherwise I'm happy to say good evening. Questions? Anybody want to start? Lori? Uh, right. Sure. So going back to the um, some of the Bring capital. Up, Wendy, please. Uh, capital projects. You would mentioned with the the gateway entrance project right. that that was in here. Where is that? And we, we weren't here when we, uh, on Monday, I think we talked about that coming, that that was not in the budget, my understanding was, but that it would come out of the um, special projects under city council. So that's not in one of the departments? And right. Stu, the, you right. I mean, there's not a specific that? project, okay. but we did talk about it, that it would be part of that, that $100,000 okay. that the budget subcommittee put aside for one-time projects. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's not within public works, then? It's not assigned to a department yet. Okay. But we would do it. We would oversee That's it. That's why you're discussing it. Yes, okay. Got it. You just got to figure out what it is. <laughs> <laughs> we're, get, we're pretty close on that. I think we're pretty close on that. And I, I, the young lady who's uh, doing the, the design did send me something last week. I just haven't had a chance to, okay. to get to it with just getting back okay. to work. Um, I don't have any other questions at this point. Ray? So is, are you just talking about capital projects now or... Are you going to go on to talk about all your other stuff? I, I my, think everything. My understanding was this was it. That this is uh, the extent okay, of what so we're going to do for the we presentation. We have questions uh, in the in the meat of it. Uh, the, sure. Uh, departmental budget proposal. Then you're not going to say any more, so it would be appropriate. Now, to yes, sir. Now would Ask be everything. now would be the right time. Okay. Because uh, I just have things that I'm curious about. Okay. Sure. I know you know the answer. <laughs> Um, so well, I, I hope I have the same uh, level of answers as you have confidence in me, sir. Yeah, no, I know. I'm sure you do. I just a couple of things. I'm, you know, usually when I see changes or mm -hmm. big increases, and I'm just sort of curious as to why. Sure. So I'll just, <coughs> if I can. Try. Okay. Um, so, I'm like, on, I'm going to start on page 117. Okay. Um, I just noticed that there was a significant increase in the, in the weed abatement and debris removal. I was wondering uh, what do you think is going to create that? Well, what we're finding is that that's the actual expense. That, so the weed abatement and removal is something that we go through and we put requests for quotations at every year. So that's what it's turned out to be the actual cost. So we've just been underpricing it? In we, that's correct. So that's correct. We've just been underpricing it. Okay. So that's the one you're talking about where we went up from 10,000 to 27,000 right. on the weed abatement. Right. Yes, sir. Okay. And and was that on just our own structures and grounds? Public right of way, yes, ma'am. So I get the same notice that every citizen gets every year from the North County Fire <laughs> Authority. I get a lot of them too because of all the properties we have, so we have quite a list. If I may just piggyback on that. So, um, part of our franchise agreement Aren't we going to have something that's built in to that agreement where they're going to be collecting debris in, in the public right of way on, on our roads? That is, but it wouldn't be part of the weed abatement, sir. So they still do, they're, they're going to be, we're asking them to do not, uh, not weed right. abatement. Well, it's got weed abatement and debris removal. Yes, but it's more weed abatement. This is it's not. It's not, weed. it's not the, so part of the debris removal that we're, we've been doing is on a number of streets. Scavengers have been going through on a monthly basis now with a crew of three to five people and picking up litter. So that's the type of debris removal that's going to be happening under the franchise. Okay, so this debris removal is, is just like just the taking the trees and branches and then exactly, exactly. pulling them away. It's mostly wood. It's fibrous type stuff as opposed to litter. Got it. Okay. Right, right. Okay, so then on page uh, 118, I'm just trying to figure out where things are at. Uh, this, this is where the uh, retaining wall in San Bruno Avenue is. Um, 119? 118. 118, the page book. Um, sure. But we're also going to be doing uh, that extensive uh, slope repair on Bayshore Boulevard by Guadalupe Canyon Parkway. That's not in there because we haven't brought that back to you yet. We haven't. I've just got the, uh, the plans on that, and I've got the estimates. And before I bring that back to you, I need to have a conversation with the adjoining property owner uh -huh. so we can ascertain the cost split. So you're correct. That is not in here. Okay. So will that be in addition to... It'll be a supplemental. Budgeting? Yes, sir, as we bring it to you. That's correct. Mm, okay. And what is... What were our anticipated 
costs on that? The budget number that I told you was 225. And our share will actually be a little bit less than that. I think we're going to be more in the 150, 175 range. The property owner's UPC. Yes, sir. It's half their slope. Yeah. They should get half the joy. They should get half the joy. Seems reasonable. Seems reasonable to me. <laughs> So, Stuart, did you, had you taken that into account when we get into the overall figures? No, since we don't have it in the budget, it's not taken into account. If you would like, we can add that as a placeholder. Of, you know, maybe put, you know, 200 as a placeholder. Because yeah, that seems like a pretty substantial amount that we ought to be aware of. Where would you put it? <clears throat> Ground maintenance? Or? 42 streets, yeah. since it's the public right away. That's, okay. That would be my inclination, sir. But it's enough money that I'd probably just put it in CIP. Yeah, I would say put it in the capital. Yeah. It, CIP. Whichever way the what council kind of is, the is most comfortable. Right? It, it, it is an improvement. I mean, it, it, it is an improvement. Yeah, so it's capital. What do they call that? Serious money? Anything over $100,000? <laughs> that many zeros starts to be serious. Real money? Yeah. No. Well, uh, you know, I think part of it is going to be, um, you know, if there's other, if we can find different funding for it as well, you know, and I think as we bring that project back, you know, we'll look at our, you know, where we are in capital project money. It might come out of 400. Um, we'll see how the business license is doing. I think last year, I'm going to look to Betsy. We had about 350 to 400 thousand in business license money for capital projects, right? So this year, so in 13, 14, about three to four hundred thousand dollars in business license going into capital. Next, you know, we would assume we're going to be somewhere in the same range next year. And I budgeted three hundred, so we might be a little bit higher than that next year. So we might want to look at what we have available in capital projects, and it, it might be better. You know, to, we can budget it for in capital projects. We can see you know where we are on that. And then as we come closer to having the project be completed to see specifically, you know, what money is available um, from there and if there's other places we can cobble funding from. So that's probably where we would, you know, where I'd suggest moving at this point in time. Okay. Um, a lot of the questions that I had written to myself that I wanted to Fire about that you answered when we talked about the capital projects because they are incorporated throughout, and so I had all these questions and when they're all combined in one place, then I took care. Of it. Good, I'm glad, sir. But I have a few other minor things, just out of curiosity. Uh, page 136. 136, it is then. Um, I'm looking at Gopher and Pest Control. Yes. And I notice that Pest Control goes to zero, so I'm wondering what the explanation for that is. This is, which line is it? It's your point in landscape lighting. Right. Yeah, 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 I'm on page 136, sir, but we're... No, 135. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry, I heard 136. I, went, I, I heard that, too, 136. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. So, the pest control. Stump me. It's a great question. That I do not know what my staff did there. I, it, it, been, it could have been a typing thing. Let me go look. I'll be back. Went into tree trimmings. <laughs> okay, while you're looking that up, I have another question on page... Um, no, it was zero, so you're okay. It was zero. Right? Yeah, it was zero. I just don't have the explanation in hand. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll get it to you, sir. Okay, so now I'm looking at uh, GBMID on page. Let me read it right this time. I had my glasses misfocused, sorry. <laughs> I'm having the same problem with transitionals. So. Um, on page 144, um, <clears throat> I'm looking at, uh, again, the maintenance and structures and the tree replacement. Uh, it, it only has $1,000, and the reason that I'm concerned about that is that we all know that in GVMID, uh, a lot of the trees are dying. 
because of the bark beetle disease. Right. Now, of course, many of them are in private property, exactly. but on the other hand, there a lot of the absentee landowners don't seem to care very much about that. Um, and we are, in effect, I believe the council is the GBMID association. You are, yes, sir. Uh, and we could do something about, you know, tree replacement and uh, making sure that we maintain the, the, you know, the tree beauty. I mean, that's one of the beautiful things originally about right. Right. the Crocker Park was, was all the trees and the grass and so forth. And and so there's not, there doesn't seem to be a deliberate program of replacing the trees all over. I mean, I'm not just talking about, you know, city, but also the ones on private property. Uh, and I'm wondering if we ought to think about doing that as, a, you know, we're talking about, the, you know, the enhancing the Crocker Park, and that's what the TAP was all about. And mm -hmm. part of enhancing that area is the maintenance of the foliage and the trees and so forth. And it would seem to me that we ought to have a program uh, to address that issue, uh, and that's going to cost some money. Um, I don't know how we might be able to raise that money, and the association has means to do that, I guess, but that's another conversation. But uh, I do think that we need to really address the, you know, the replacement of all those trees that are dying and being you know, uh, cut and, and not really replaced, and it's going to really cut into the aesthetics, you know, the aesthetics of, sure. of the park. So you, you, you caught me with three questions there, sir. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the first one was, you know, the amount of money that we have in there for tree trimming and maintenance. And you caught me on the opposite end of the question mm -hmm. because we had never had money in there in GVMID before that. This is the first time we've added in. So you sort of asked in the opposite, like maybe there would be more. We think that's enough for the limited amount of maintenance we do. Uh, I, I think I'm going to have to sit down and really figure out what sort of authorities we actually have in there. I'm not aware how much authority we have uh, onto the private property. But I think in... I think we have quite a bit, actually, because it is the special district legislation that, that needs... So, I, I mean, just to let, to look at yeah. well, to let you know, Open Space and Ecology Committee is trying to work, you know, they're, they're trying to work through a plan for the Crocker Industrial Park when it comes to tree replacement, because they recognize the same issue that you recognize. And I, if you've been watching their committee mm -hmm. meetings, you've heard them talking about it and trying to figure out you know and we went out and we got we solicited bids from different companies as to what the overall cost was we were then going to you know come back to council with some kind of plan working with randy and his staff as to how do we go about making this happen and some of the things maybe is some of the rules we have about how quickly you need to replace a tree once you've taken it down and then of course open space and ecology committees had this conversation and would like to continue the conversation with public works is what kinds of trees do you replace it with because you get a whole big issue with that is do you replace it with trees of similar style or do you, as I've been talking to them, do you replace them with trees that are going to survive 30 to 40 years down the road as we see some of the climate change happen? So, I mean, I think Open Space and Ecology Committee is, has this awareness, and I think when they have a plan, they're going to talk with Public Works and then bring a overall plan as to, you know, what it might cost and how to fund it back to the City Council. So that's part of the process going on and I think the additional wrinkle that I'm going to add into that is one of the things that we need to think about is the whole concept we have for that plan development out there about how it's a very manicured landscaped lawn right and is that really the most prudent environment for us to have as we go into climate change right. as we go into drought and, and maybe what we ought to start doing is replacing some of that lawn right as we move along and replace it with native plants, things that are in fact drought resistant. And if like we're going to go down there, does that require, I'm sorry? Yeah. Something like across the street or? or, or exactly. exactly. And, and, and right. if you're going to do that, what sort of trees make sense with that? Mm -hmm. Because now you're going to create a whole new environment and you would want them to work together. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't want them competing for each other. You want trees that can live in that environment. They're a very low water type environment. So it, it's an interesting conversation. It's certainly stuff that, you know, obviously, open space has been working on it. The replacement of the I of the lawns, that things that water departments some been kind of placeholder in the budget here, even if it's just a you know conceptual plan as to how to approach this whole issue. Sure, I don't I don't know if we um, want to put it in here. If we want I, to I really space. think you know, sure. um, as open space and ecology is aware of, and you know, Ellen the court, uh, you know, quite a few years ago, you know, had a, you know, she paid for a specialist to come in and look at the whole bark beetle situation. Right. She informed all the property owners, and of course, so many of them at that time anywhere, or, you know, in Denver or Chicago, or right. they didn't give a damn, you know. And and uh, 
Well, and all they were concerned about is how much rent can I get next month, you know. So, but, but the GVMID does have, I think, some kind of uh, responsibility generally for the, you know, the, the, the whole park uh, ambiance well, and, and its quality of, of landscaping and so well, forth. This, and so I would hope that we would, you know, really address it and use whatever recommendations. The city attorney says. owes us an analysis on That's that. right. You're yeah. right about that. Right. That's <laughs> what I was going to suggest we <laughs> yeah. have David. moved it up from yeah. when we did his uh, evaluation. It, it's right. now moved back up on the list. That's so. right. That should be part of uh, the yeah, whole absolutely. thing. Yeah. Absolutely. I definitely say we give it to David since he's not here. Yeah. It's, a, it's a great idea. <laughs> since David's not here, so. <laughs> no. yeah. But I do think we ought to, you know, start thinking about it and maybe at least put the placeholder you know, conceptual plan for addressing the landscaping issues in the proper park, something like that. Sure. Agreed. And to piggyback on that, um, I, I know I've talked with, um, I think, Stuart about this, about, you know, whether on city properties we have um, irrigation that has the technology that you know responds to weather so that we're not watering unnecessarily and I know that's something we installed recently um, through the HOAs up at the ridge and it saves a lot of money on water so I, I would hope that we could include that in any conceptual plan as well sure. Back to you, sir. Okay. Uh, now I'm my glasses on page 148. <laughs> okay, I think I've got it right this time. Okay, now we're in Nipties. the CDES. Oh, my favorite topic. Yeah. This is this is just yeah. lovely. Uh, I, you know, I had some specific questions about some of the pretty big amounts in here. There really are. This is where you're going to find the biggest changes. Yeah, I noticed that, and, uh, and then, of course the follow-up after talking about the specific things is. So, you know, the whole 218 uh, set of issues. Yes, exactly. Uh, but anyway, on uh, I noticed, uh, you know, the, the storm drain trash capture devices. Exactly. $30,000. Yep. And then uh, enhanced street sweeping. hundred grand. thousand dollars Yep. And then the storm drain trash capture, 50000 I mean, that's a lot of dough. Adds up to 180 grand. Yeah. Sir. So, um, why, why don't you just for general, explain you know, why we have to do that, and then uh, so people understand that we're just not uh, you know, spending money just for the hell of it. Uh, and sure. What are we going to try to do to finance it? Sure. So let me give you just kind of a, a thumbnail sketch on that, because the intent that we've always had was that when we brought the final franchise agreement with you was to bring you a rather lengthy, and I hope not too boring, explanation about how many years we've been working on the municipal regional permit how we were, how we determined what sort of trash zones we had out here, what the level of trash was, how we had to divide those up into trash management areas, and what the final game plan was and do that. So effectively what it comes down to is this. We are regulated by the Regional Water Quality Control Board of San Francisco Bay, so that's Region 2. They have, we have a municipal regional permit, and we have a requirement by 2020. Originally a requirement said zero litter, zero litter. Nobody could define what that meant, so after much negotiation, we've defined that to say no visible impact because of litter. So what we've been doing as we work through the franchise with Scavenger and with Recology is to put requirements in there in one way or another that make the solid waste hauler really responsible for all of the solid waste because they haven't been. You know, we've just cities eaten it up out of the general fund. And really, it's people that generate trash at their homes, at their businesses, that it's getting away from them. In some cases, it's because you have debris bins that are left open. In some cases, it's because people are throwing stuff out. In some cases, it's because trash cans are not being emptied. So we're anticipating that there are a number of things that the hauler will have to do under the contract. And Mr. Lentz talked about one of them. He talked about, you know, the, the monthly walkthroughs that they do. We're also going to require them in that contract to be responsible for picking up all the trash cans in the city and for refurnishing the mutt mints and doing that so that they don't overflow. They're, they're the solid waste hauler. This is what we think they should be doing. But in addition to that, to meet the, the permit requirements, we are going to have to have significant increases mm. in street sweeping to the tune of about hundred grand a year. And some of that is really, as we talk with South San Francisco, and it's most likely that they, we are going to continue our agreement with them, and they're going to be the, the agency that provides its services. We're going to go out and buy, they're going to have to go out and buy a special piece of equipment to do our streets because we recognize that our streets are very steep 
and you just you, you're not going to be able to put no parking zones <laughs> on 90 percent of the streets in town where the heck are they going to go you know and because well you might say well we could just have them not park on humboldt and we'll just do humboldt street well that sounds like a good idea but you can't get a street sweeping company to say well i'll drive down to brisbane and do one street that, that just it just doesn't happen so what we're going to end up getting is a small piece of equipment that's got a little wand on it that you can reach out you've probably seen something very similar to what we're talking about if you've I know I see it a lot on Grand Avenue down in South San Francisco where it's kind of it's a mad vac is what they call it. So he drives on it, looks like a tiny little golf cart. And he's got this big, you know, it looks like a six-inch hose, and he's got a wand he can reach out because that's what we need. I mean, mm-hmm. That's the only way you're going to get to the curb. We're not going to get people to move. Maybe on San Bruno Avenue it might be feasible to, to have no parking so that we can really get to the curb. On Visitation Avenue we already have it posted and we already enforce there. That's fine, but. It just doesn't work in central Brisbane. It just doesn't work here. So that's going to happen. The trash capture devices, what we're talking about there is that the board is really going to the point where they want to see as much as they can a full capture trash device. So that's installing a device inside your storm drain catch basins that doesn't allow anything beyond, I don't remember what the micron limit is, to go through it. They are not that expensive. You know, depending upon your size, there would be a couple grand a piece. But when you've got 100 of them that you've got to install, over a five-year period, it starts to add up, mm. and then you have to maintain them. Maintain them. you got to go out there twice a year and maintain right. them because you can't just let them fill up. Right. So that's where the, st- the costs start to come in, and that's why we're doing what it is that we're doing. And, again, all of these costs presume that that revenue will be sourced from the franchise agreement. So the last part of my question was about the 218. So, right, so the 218, we will have to do that like we do with any fee that we impose, with a property-related type fee that we do. So we will have to bring that forward when we bring the franchise fee increase. So, but there was this conversation about doing it countywide. This is, where does that sit? Oh, okay, yes, sir. Oh, thank I'm sorry. I, there's a lot of 218s involved in this. Right. So certainly we'll have to do the 118 for our franchise and our fee increase. There is another 218 that is looking at imposing fees, requesting fees, that is really not going to be supplementing this. Th- that is going to be taking care of the other requirements okay. that we have on there. The, the pending requirements, the regional permit, the way it's established right now, has no less than 15 chapters. And talking about trash, what we're doing in here is just one of the chapters. This is just C10. Mm-hmm. There's a bunch of others that we have to deal with. The biggest one that's going to be expensive is going to be dealing with PCBs, it's going to be dealing with legacy PCBs and how we get rid of those. So that's primarily when that county plan comes up, that's how we're going to do that. that ca- it's actually been on hold for a little bit because one of the things we've been struggling with is getting the legislation passed to make it crystal clear that CCAG has the authority as an entity to go out and impose those fees. Did I get it that time, sir? You got the yeah, no, second I, part I, of it. I, I, but uh, we don't know where that is legislatively. I don't know the latest update. I don't know which committee it's before or not. Mr. Mullen was sponsoring the bill for us. Mullen was. Yes. It, it wasn't um, clear-cut where it was the last CCAG meeting, and we have another meeting tomorrow, and I'm sure we'll probably get an update. We usually get a monthly update on, on where that authorization is and then where their surveys are on what, how much money they anticipate they could ask voters for and what timing they're going to be asking voters if we do it at a countywide mm-hmm. level. And Matt does the update, right? Yes, sir. Matt Mr. Fabry, right? Yeah, you can just call him too, huh? <laughs> update, email it to us. <laughs> Another good Get employee stolen by others. So. Yeah. Uh, Ready? Okay, those are my questions. Thank okay, you that's much. it. Terry? Um, on page 119. to get back to it. Our utilities went down tremendously, and I'm wondering what we did right. I think primarily what we did right was just get a better handle on the accounting for it. That's all. That's just reflecting that, that our actual costs are lower than what we budgeted, that's all. So that's nothing to do with putting in LED streetlights or... No, ma'am. Actually, if you look at the electricity bills as a result of that, they're a little higher. 
because part of what we're doing right now in the electricity bills is we're paying back the cost of doing that on bill financing. So in some of those cases, some of our, our electricity costs look higher. This is, this is just, that is just a reflection of what we do. Every year as we go through, sometimes you, you're going to see changes in the budget, and it has absolutely nothing to do with anything we've done right, wrong, or indifferent. It's just that we've got different people looking at it, and we've refined the costs, and we're capturing them in a different way so we understand what we really need there. So we're trying to really make the budget better every year. It's, it is a planning tool, and it's supposed to be flexible. But to the extent that we can, without killing ourselves counting beans, we try to make sure that we've got a handle within a couple thousand dollars of what every item is going to be. It gives us enough leeway to move things around between accounts within a department, but not, you know, make it so overburdensome that that's all we're doing is tracking it. And some of this in the budget, uh, part of the reason it's, it's difficult is we're not looking at your budget with the actuals that, you know, preceded. It was just budgets across the board instead of actuals. So... Um, and well, we do have actual expenditures on the main page, don't we, ma'am? So, so I think page, like on the main yeah, page, page 115 would show the actuals mm -hmm. that we had through 2012-2013. Right. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, the actuals for the utilities, I mean, there has been a slight trend downward over the time. Right. But Randy is right. If you turn to page, um, page 109, which is the overall... Public Works Department, mm -hmm. you know, their utilities are, you know, they're projecting slightly higher than it's been. The actual in 12-13 was 383. They're projecting something around 417 this year right. for the overall department. And, and a lot of the challenges are that this fiscal year, um, if you remember, we used to have a team leader who was in charge of a lot of these budgets and was you know, presenting them, giving them to Randy. Randy was reviewing them. This year, there's a new team leader, so new eyes have been put on it. And also, there is another intermediary. We've got a senior civil engineer who is also reviewing these kinds of costs and making sure that they can track all of their costs to where the, you know, a better way of where they're supposed to be. Um, you know, there were some, uh, you know, in the previous years, I think, you know, the We've always worked towards bottom line numbers for a department, and we're always concerned that is the department within the right bottom line. Um, so I think the previous team leader would look at bottom lines and say, as long as we're good bottom line throughout the department, we're okay. And I think now what the new team leader and the new civil, senior civil engineer are looking at it says, is this the right place to be charging these items? And it's always better to get things better charged. So that way, you, when you as council start making those policy decisions, can say, yeah, you know, that makes more sense to me. It gets back to what, you know, Ray has been talking about, what Cliff has been talking about, was getting closer to program-based budgeting. And, you know, and for all of our departments, public works, other than Parks and Recreation now, has had the best program-based budgeting because they break out their department in so many various ways. So it's really, if you look at page 109, you get a better sense of overall how the department is doing on the budget. Thank you. Quick quibble on 109. You got a formatting error on that one. Your column is not spread out enough or something in your spreadsheet. Fourth column from the left says number ref. Oh, yeah. Under total salary still. Yeah. That's under actual expended. Yeah, we didn't want to tell you. No, it formats all the way through. I mean, if you look at it. Is it number or hashtags? It's, 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 no, it's number ref. That means there's another one that's picking it up that's number ref Yeah, it's, it's someplace it's, else. It's, it's formatting issues. Uh, something. Uh, right. Go ahead, Terry. I don't have any questions right now. Oh, that's it? Yep. Okay, Cliff. I don't have any questions. It was a very good presentation, Randy. So. Thanks, sir. Thank you. That's it. Thank you, Randy. Thank you, sir. You probably want to go home. Hey. I haven't been tracking that's not the fair. Game, sir, so that's I'm not, not sure fair. the last two that's nights. A, that's not fair. You got off go vacation. No. <laughs> I got to torture you, man. <laughs> no. <laughs> not very good. Thank, what thank time you. is it, Alan Brussels? Huh? <laughs> Nine hours later. <laughs> Clay, uh, anything to punish him about? No. <laughs> I don't think it's nice to that. Um, just to let you know, one of the issues that Randy didn't bring up that we that you talked about at the last budget meeting 
was the pool projects. And one of the things that I did, you know, going back and looking at the documents that the department gave me, they gave me eight, a budget of $8,500 to do the plans and specifications for a lot of the pool work. That you were wondering who would be the expert in overseeing it. So I need to add back $8,500 within the pool budget to cover the plans and specifications for that. And that will show up on your resolution A or exhibit A on the resolution next week. And at the end of the meeting, I want to talk a little bit about the resolution for next week. Thank you. Chief? Good evening, Honorable Mayor and Council Members. We're at the Police Department budget. So we will start with the first slide. This one may be a little confusing. When it talks about non-patrol, it's focusing on those individuals that are not, not in the patrol services, which would be um, our community service officer, our records uh, division or records analyst, and the administration, which is uh, Commander Meisner and myself. So these are just some of the items that um, some of the things that are done, professional research, and I apologize, um, Councilmember O'Connell, the percentages are not there. Uh, COP activity, which is community-oriented policing activity, vehicle maintenance, traffic enforcement, parking um, and abandoned vehicles, evidence processing, court-related duties, public inquiries, and those, a lot of those are kind of inner, they're, they're, they, they interact on both with our community service officer and records. Um, under, I have some percentages, if Councilmember O'Connell would like uh, more percentage-wise. What I did originally was break it down, and I have those written down, so those aren't actually going to be up there. But under records, um, we have our records analyst who spends 30% of her time doing data entry. She spends 20% of her time doing payables, uh, public inquiries, which is dealing with the front counter and those individuals coming in, is about 15% of her time. Um, off official reports and statistics, which are reports that go to the Department of Justice, she spends about 20% of her time. And 15% of her time is just on miscellaneous administrative duties. As you're aware, we, we eliminated the administrative uh, assistant position when our secretary retired Maggie and we distributed those responsibilities amongst Commander Meisner and myself and our records analyst also took on some of those responsibilities. So under our community service officer, if those of you have seen Morgan with the light blue um, uh, uniform out on, out on the streets, she does a lot of, she does a lot more than we give her credit for. She does um, court she does all our court-related duties, and those are about 10% of her time. Evidence processing is about 30% of her time. Parking in abandoned vehicles runs about 20% of her time. Traffic enforcement, if we have a major collision out on the roadway, she'll come out and do some traffic enforcement, uh, f about 5% of her time. Vehicle maintenance is dealing with all the issues with, uh, that come up with our, our patrol vehicles is 20% of her time. She does community-oriented policing activities, which is installing car seats, <coughs> reading to the children at the libraries, attending a lot of our, of our events. Um, that's about 5% of her time. And then she does other miscellaneous duties, duties as things come up. And under administration, it falls under myself and Commander Meisner. And we deal with about uh, personnel matters, which is about 5%, meetings both internal and external, uh, general public meetings and inquiries and complaints. Uh, report review, general staff and supervision is about 10%. Budgeting and purchasing is about 5%. Uh, professional research, about 10%. Staff reports and official correspondence is about 15%. And other administrative duties, uh, which is dealing with the telephone and um, uh, building security and any other, and IT and any other things that come up. And again, I can give you percentages, but all of that is, can change on a daily basis because we, it just depends on what comes, comes through the day. Um, on a daily basis. So the next slide is how we broke down the department, um, patrol services. And I have day shift because you'll see with the next slide on night shift, it's completely different. So um, on patrol, on a day shift, they spend, officers will spend about 40% of their time writing reports. And what, what that falls under is investigations. So they'll be doing, um, as you, I think I, uh, Mayor, Council member, Mayor uh, Clark uh, Conway had mentioned about day shift during the day we have about three times the, 
the population that we do during the night of our residents because we have all the businesses open. So as you can imagine, the businesses are calling in uh, fraud or embezzlement cases. So 40% of the officer's time is actually taking investigations and writing their reports. The other 30% is under proactive uh, policing, which is traffic enforcement, parking enforcement, a DUI enforcement, a directed patrol, which is just driving around, a special assignments, which encompass GTF, uh, human trafficking a task force and avoid the 23 and any other events that we that we work collaboratively with um, other agencies in the county and then under the other 30 percent is reactive so those are basically answering calls for service um, they get a call for service the officer responds medical calls those would be um, crimes in progress uh, traffic accidents hazardous material response and um, traffic control incidents and that's your day shift patrol and again Numbers can change drastically depending if they're taking a big investigation. It could be 100% of their time is spent inside writing investigation. So we have nighttime patrol, and that's broken down. As you can see the difference, um, their report writing drops tremendously because now we're just dealing with the, the, our own residential population, which at night, most of the half of the shift, most of the residents are sleeping. So you have about 15% of your investigations on night shift. Um, and then you have your reactive patrol, which is up about 20%, because our calls for service will drop during the night shift. And then our, our proactive patrol, and that's officers going out there driving around looking for what doesn't belong, something that is out of the, out of, out of the normal. So you could see the difference in, in the three. The new items in the budget for fiscal year 14-15 is the two new officers and update uh, technology. I'll talk a little bit about the two new officers. As you remember, you graciously granted us the two positions in fiscal year 13-14. We did fill both of those positions. We currently have one officer who's been on his own for the last three weeks and has been a great um, asset to the department and to the community. And the second position, after seven weeks in the field training uh, program, the officer, the trainee, felt that law enforcement was probably not the best profession for him, so he resigned. Subsequently, during this same fiscal year, we had one of our tenure officers who's been with us 10 years uh, leave our department and go on to another agency. So we're back down to two positions that are open in this fiscal year. And we are asking for two new officers in fiscal year 14-15. We recently did a, a recruitment about two weeks ago, and we were able to get some very good candidates. We were very lucky. I think timing is, every, every, is everything. Uh, everyone in the county is, is hiring. So we're competing with everybody else in the county. So the pool is getting smaller and smaller. But we were able to, to really identify seven good candidates. We started the background process on currently five. And I say five because we have another officer who's currently looking at leaving. She has some personal family matters and wants to live, uh, work closer to home and have a, be a more stable schedule for her and her family life. The other uh, item is the update in technology. As uh, Clay and Stewart both discussed in their budget overview, the need for this year being the need for um, some of the departments to kind of catch up on some areas. For us, technology um, needed to get done immediately only because we will be taking on that new records management system. In, this, in the summertime, we'll be going live. So we needed to get an analysis and evaluation of where our IT system was <clears throat> and our infrastructure with our IT to make sure that it was up and current to be able to take on this new records management system. And during that time, we were able to now currently be up, up and running and current. And during that evaluation, we realized that there was a real need to have an IT maintenance contract that will allow us to be monitored, our IT system, to be monitored 24-7 because we do run 24-7. So we need to make sure that there's no, um, there's no area for the system to go down. A lot of the uh, new changes in the county are becoming paperless, and it's all electronic from the new jail management system to um, in the future going with the district attorney's office and prosecuting cases or submitting cases to the district attorney's office electronically as well. So as you could see, there's a real, a, a real need to make sure that the police department's um, computer system stays up and running 24-7. And those are, that's the conclusion of my uh, budget overview. Council members have any questions? Questions? Cliff, I want to start with you. Do you have any questions? Um, you know, I, I do not. Uh, but, you know, thank you, Lisa. I mean, you guys do a great job, and um, I, I, you know, I know that uh, you've been without the two officers for a while. Um, having the, the two new officers will help with things like over, overtime and um, being able to 
get back into the community the way that I think the community uh, hopes that, uh, uh, you know, some of the things that, that we've had in the past. Um, yeah, one of the things that, that, you know, that we did let go, and I do have a question about is, you know, um, you know, having that connection with the schools. Um, where are we with that? I mean, do you do you foresee that that coming back into your budget um, sometime in the future? We, when we no longer had the school resource officer position, because that was a grant that uh, that the state had given us, okay. we kept the position as a uh, school liaison. So we did have an officer that stayed on as a school liaison. Unfortunately, it was the officer that did leave our city to a Hillsborough Police Department officer Javiana so we hope that once we get our staffing levels back up to where we need to be as part of um, is, is to get reconnected with the schools absolutely All right. okay, thanks Terry um, I know when we've been down the officers in our um, the 2013-14 budget for overtime we have 120,000 listed I'm assuming we exceeded last year's budget in overtime, but I don't have a figure for that or a approximation. Um, do you have any ideas? I think I do have the last. Bob, I'll call you up here because my just a guess. My vision <laughs> at night. I know this was. <laughs> I know I, I'm getting close. Well, right now. Um, we were Bob and I were just discussing that the other day when we had our our most recent um, usage budget usage numbers. Yeah, I'm not sure if this is the, the latest one or not, but um, if I remember correctly, we're about thirty thousand dollars over budget over in our overtime budget. However, we've saved quite a bit on the other end by having the open positions. So I, th I think at the end of the day, you're, there's going to be a cost savings there. Um, so we do expect uh, overtime this month again to. Uh, continue probably ten fifteen thousand dollar range um, but again uh, if you equal out all the numbers from our vacancies uh, against our overtime we're still going to be uh, under budget thank you thank you that it? that's it great hey, uh, <coughs> excuse me <coughs> but just to follow up on that um, And that is the, the, the issue of overtime. Um, I think one of the reasons that we're you know, hoping that you can up the complement of police officers is uh, uh, to reduce the overtime, but it's not only a matter of cost, it's also, I guess, a lot of stress on the officers um, because, you know, Somehow or other, overtime doesn't seem to be a big stress for firefighters, but it's a lot different for police officers because, you know, you're on the go all the time. <laughs> uh, and so, you, you know, you can't take the kind of breaks that the firefighters can in between things. Um, and so there's, you know, just a different kind of job requirement. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering about, you know, how we can really ad address that issue. I mean, I know we talked about before how difficult it is to, to get new police officers and particularly ones who are community oriented and, you know, fit into Brisbane and all that sort of thing. And then there's all this you know, competition and I don't know, I, I, I'd just be interested in your observations on, the, on the, the whole problem that you're trying to grapple with and deal with. Right, and I, and I think you're right. It's a very, right now we're competing against other agencies. Every agency right now is is feeling the shortages. Um, and we, it's a different, a different um, the applicants that are coming through just aren't some of the ones that, that would be good police officers, that would be successful. And, and again, I'm looking for not just a body to fill. I'm looking for the right personality that's going to fit in our department because we want somebody who's going to stay here and wants to work here and, and it's going to be a good fit. Otherwise, we get somebody that's here for just a year and gets the training and gets their foot in the door and then moves on to another department. And we've been fortunate the ones that we have brought on have stayed, have given us quite a, quite a, quite a number of years. But I think this last uh, recruitment process, the first recruitment process we did, it had been a while since we had gone through a recruitment. So it was a learning experience, I think, both for HR, ourselves, and Commander Meisner and myself. But this time around, the second time around, we were able to streamline, streamline, it, streamline it much better 
and we are able to move things quickly. For example, the day we had the oral boards for the, these, re, these applicants, we also did the administrative um, interview right after. So then we can get things going and have them in the following couple of days. So we actually, I'm really happy with um, the last recruitment process. I think that we're going to get some really good applicants coming through. But you're right, it, it, it has been, it's been difficult, and I think we're not the only ones that are feeling it. Other, other departments are feeling the same thing. I mean, we're getting to the point where, you know, a lot of these individuals are applying not only for our department, but for many other departments, and they're looking for the first, first um, city to offer them a job. Mm -hmm. And although we would like to, I mean, we, our process was taken a little slower. Some agencies do in-house backgrounds mm -hmm. because they have their big agencies and they can do that. We do. We actually contract out for our backgrounds. But again, we were able to, to streamline it, streamline it much, much better. And I think we're gonna. These, this group, I was really, really happy with the group that we had coming through. And many of them, the personalities were would be a great fit. And they were, they were individuals that were excited um, to come on board. So we're hoping that everything will, will continue to proceed forward. We have five in backgrounds right now, and things so far are going smoothly. So I, I would say maybe in the next. It's kind of hard to say. I think the next process would be their uh, psychological and then their medical. So we could say probably within a month, month and a half, we can have five on board in the training program. Mm -hmm. okay. well, let's hope. Huh? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, two other things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you were talking about the you know the information technology maintenance contract. Um, and I see it's here for 31800 And I guess kind of my question is uh, the coordination of this, and I guess this is not only to you but also to, to Stuart, because, I mean, this is not only an issue uh, for you all, even though it's a special one for you, I understand that, but also for the entire operation of the city. Um, you know, uh, and how is all this getting coordinated and uh, is this all going to be working together in a fashion that, that's effective? Uh, as, you know, if every department has got something of this nature, that, you know, the whole thing's going to get pretty expensive. So we want to make sure we're, we're, it, it's happening in an effective way. Yes, so the police department worked with Albert um, on this issue. I mean, there's a particular challenges that the police department have that I that you know in finance we don't they interact with DOJ they interact with the FBI database so there's a level of there's some issues there that you know other departments don't have so they brought in Nev, NevTech who have expertise in that area the other issue that the police department has that really the other departments don't is the 24/7 nature of their business as you said the fire department seem to be able to take a rest during their shifts, whereas the police department never really has that same ability to rest, because if they do, they get phone calls um, when they're in their cars and they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. So their 24-7 issues are different from everybody else's. So what we thought was it was best to work with a, another firm, and Albert you know, recognized it as well. So from there, we are also looking at the overall city issues when it comes to the same kinds of issues. You know, we've asked for NevTech to tell, you know, give us their thoughts. Or, um, it's, a, it's the firm that the police department uses to update their computers, to keep the network up and running for them. Over the years, there's been a lot more capabilities of doing that off-site and doing it remotely. Um, so that's what their look, that's what their, the model the police department has gone to, to make sure that they have 24-7 response. We're looking at the same kind of thing for our city to see what they can do to keep our, you know, to have backup for us, to have our ability to interact between different systems. One of the chal particular challenges in the police department is, you know, you have the video in the cars has to interact with, you know, what's going on in the hard drives in the station. Um, that needs to be up and running, and because they're doing video, they've got a lot more storage responsibility or needs than others of so being able to maintain that and starting to look at how do you maintain the security of that and have flexibility. And part of it is, you know, as you, we talked about before, having more stuff being stored in the cloud. But then if you're going to have more stuff stored in the cloud, how do you ensure that specific, especially in the police department's 
area that specific need for security. And NevTech has that specialty. So that's why we brought them in. Um, so, but we've also asked them to look at our overall city and what they would recommend to update and bring our technology back up into the 2014. We talked about this during the opening. You know, we really put on hold after 2006 updating what we were doing. Um, so we, we've talked to NevTech. We've also talked to Ensight today about the same kinds of issues, like how do we bring our system more up to date and also recognizing how do we integrate it with not only the police department, not only the fire department issues, but also how do we integrate it with the telephone, how do we integrate it with you know email, how do we integrate it with different computer platforms, be it tablet, be it um, laptop, where you know wherever you are that you can get your email. So there's a lot of those kinds of issues. And that's what, you know, so we're working closely with what the police department has done um, to make sure that we get an overall city plan. When we bring, when we do get that overall city plan, we would bring back to the technology subcommittee and talk about how do how does everything integrate and what is the right solution. And there's a lot of things you can't do offsite. You know, when you bring a new computer on, you can't do that offsite. So there's, you know, if you have an immediate problem with a computer, you can't do that remotely. So those are the kinds of things, you know, that we would still be looking at our own staff to do. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, we are fully aware of what the police department did, and we are working to integrate what they're doing with what we're doing, but recognizing that their firewalls and some of their security issues have different, and that's why they went first. Because, you know, when they're down, it becomes a bigger problem, especially if you talk about, you know, case, police cases and, you know, um, the DA needing information. You can't have them not be ahead of waiting for the city to catch up to them. No, that, that's a very interesting response. Appreciate it very much. Uh, so you're kind of the pioneers, right? Yeah, we are. <laughs> okay. I'm happy to be. <laughs> yeah, good. Uh, then I had just one other uh, observation that um, it's kind of a request, I guess. Um, you know, a lot of the things that go on within your department are, are pretty interesting to most everybody, and certainly to us. <coughs> Uh, and yet we don't really have a regular system of information. There's no real, um, you know, monthly report or whatever. I don't know. You know, these are the really the number of cases that we've had or these are the interesting things. I mean, a lot of really high visibility things have come up. And then we hear about them, you know, at the, at the point of high visibility. But then what happens to them two, three, four months that down the road, you know, somehow or other, that information at least doesn't get to me anyway. Uh, and I'm curious. I'd you know, like to know what's going on. You know, like, you know, the, there was that, you know, skeleton that was found and we did the, the person did the facsimile of what the person probably looked like. But then what's happened to that? You know, I mean, it's just kind of disappeared somewhere. And, and there have been a number of things like that, that, that you know, I'm sort of curious about, oh, okay, so what happened? <laughs> Uh, and sometimes there isn't a whole lot to report. I understand that, but but sometimes there is, and and you hear the sirens all. Well, the actually, time. actually, Clay can answer that because <clears throat> you used to do a monthly report where each department did an overview uh -huh. of all the stuff that was going on in a department. You remember those binders you used to do on a monthly basis? Yeah. And <clears throat> when we cut back, you know, because of the recession and stuff. We actually eliminated that, you uh -huh. know, because it became so time consuming for the departments that yeah. they had all these other duties and stuff. So, right. I mean, is, is that about that, that's exactly what happened? <coughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I wasn't thinking about a, you know, complete data report or anything. Just kind of update on the, you know, the more salient, more interesting, more serious issues, you know, that would, would just be kind of interesting to know, kind of maybe on one page, what's, what's going on and wh where this stands and uh, what we've been able to do on this particular set of issues or whatever, you know, I mean, I mean, it, it seems as if we've gone to maybe too much information to, to no information. And it seems to me there ought to be some place in between where we can get sort of a sense of, you know, what's happening and what's happening to various cases and, um, you mean like a quarterly thing or something? Yeah, something because like I mean, that, yeah. I know the cases yeah. take a long time to right, process. Right. They take forever to. Yeah. to right, because we do the the blog, then that's the monthly blog that we post on the website. So maybe if we add it into our 
police website. I don't know how Bob usually works on our website on maybe doing some high, maybe some of those highlighted cases, but you're right. I mean, some <laughs> cases there's really, you know, it takes months before it goes to court and there's any disposition, it could be months. And for example, was that boating incident that took, what, two years before there was closure? Right. So it would be, and then which ones would we want to, you know, I guess an idea would want to be which ones do we, what, cons what do we consider are the highlighted cases? And so I guess it's something maybe we can discuss at some point to see how we can work something that into the, the, the police website. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I, I, would, I would just, that's just my request. To, I'm kind of interested in what's happening and you know, what you're doing and so forth. And there's, there's no easy way to, at least I haven't found an easy way to, to follow that. Sometimes I just get phone calls or emails. <laughs> they just ask me, so what's happened to the status of this case? And I'll just respond back. But no, I, I, I see mm -hmm. what you're requesting. Okay, thank you. Lori? Thanks. Uh, so um, to follow up on the question that Cliff had about community-oriented policing, so you mentioned that there's the one officer that was going to the schools, move, moved away out of town, or you know le left this job and went to another <coughs> town. So it, is it possible to have someone else who's currently in the department fulfill that liaison position, or is it something that you'd have to look to one of the potential new hires for? When we had the school resource officer position through the, that was paid through the grant, we had an officer that was dedicated to just the schools. He, they, he or she would go to Brisbane Elementary School, check in with the, with the be there during some of the, the assemblies, check in with the principal, then he or she would go up to, the school resource officer would go up to Littman and do the same thing, had an area where they can just sit and review reports and be available, uh, be there during recess with the kids, interact with the kids, really build that bond, that relationship, and then would head over to the high schools, which would be Jefferson High School, uh, Terranova High School, and Oceana. And also at that point, at that time, all the schools had school resource officers, so they would go in and check in with those school resource officers to see if there were any issues that involved our kids from our community. So if there was an issue involving one of our, commu our, our one of the kids from our community, that school resource officer would be called and they would respond out there. And there would be different, I mean, we do, cities deal with, diff with their kids and certain crimes differently. So then we had the opportunity and discretion to address whatever the concern was, whether it was truancy <coughs> with the family, bless you, or whether it was, uh, you know, some behavioral issues or so forth. When that grant was eliminated, we still had enough officers to, so, to still designate an officer as a school resource officer. But as things became, as the budget times, you know, narrowed down, then we, we eliminated the school resource officer position, and we just had an officer who was a liaison. So that officer would just go up to BES and Lippman and just check in, or um, be available if something happened, they, they had a contact person. So there was no real time spent at the schools. Oh, okay. um, it was just a liaison, so if something happened to the school, the school knew who they can contact. And the officer had ex uh, expertise in juvenile related offenses. And so currently we don't have that um, any longer. We, don't, we have officers who will still go up there and check in in the schools and, you know, go in and meet the principals and just walk the schools, but no one particular officer designated. Once we get up to full force and we have some, um, some of the, the officers have, you know, get some relief and all the overtime they've been working and just trying to figure out scheduling, then we'll, we hope to one, be a, one time to be able to implement that again. But okay. for now, it's... It's just a matter of just okay. trying to get the, the patrol force back up and... Sure, and sure. Yeah, I understand. But I have to say, it, with the um, the library work that you do, um, I, I definitely have seen the benefit of that. I've been at the story time several times where, where the police have been there reading stories to the kids, and it, it's really nice. And then, um, you know, there's even been times where the officers have, like, taken us out to their patrol car and given us a tour of the car, let the kids sit in it, give out the little junior badges, and the kids just love it. And my son, actually, who's only two, he, when he sees the police car driving by, he goes, police officer. I mean, he already knows what, that, what the uniform looks like and what the car looks like. So I think it's, it's great to be able to reach out Absolutely. to the kids and get them to feel comfortable and, you know, with police and feel like, you know, there are they're people that we can turn to for help. So, and we realize there is a, there's a benefit in, in that connection between law enforcement and the kids at the school. I mean, we want it to be a positive contact, a positive, so that they can feel comfortable going to the police officer and not, not always that negative because you hear that, oh, put your seatbelt on or you're, I'm going to call the police. We don't want that <laughs> it to be a <laughs> negative that the, the, the child ends up with this, you know, 
negative connection between police officers and, and that type of, you know, environment. So we like to have that connection in a positive way. So we realize it is, it is really beneficial to get law enforcement officers up at the schools. But, you know, you are the enforcement arm of the society, you know. <laughs> so there's a little bit of that, you know, if you don't do so-and-so, we're going to call the police. And that just is kind of out there in the culture, I think. Yeah. Pretty hard to go against that. I have one, could I have one other question to follow up with Lars? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Um, you finished, Lars? Uh, I had one other question, but you, if you It's just a follow-up. Follow uh, sure. You're talking about okay. the schools and the you know, okay. connection to the schools. Uh, and, you know, with all the stuff that's going on here in the news, um, do we have a, a, a school safety program? We have, we don't have a school safety program. We have an active shooter response program protocol that, um, that we all, uh, in the county, it's a county-wide, but the school, the county is currently working on a safety school protocol, and that's working with the schools and with all the agencies in the county so that we're all on the same page. Should something happen, that we're all going to respond and, and respond in, in the same manner because we'll be, if something was to happen, we'll be act, asking for mutual aid from other agencies, and so we all need to train and be well prepared to address any type of incident like that. So, yes, the, the county is currently working on a school a safety program so that it's consistent to every school in San Mateo County. So that's up and coming. Okay, so I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm another information request. You know, when that sort of gets in place and there's some something that would be interesting for us to know about, you know, that yes. might be something, a presentation or something we can have on our agenda at some point. Because uh, I think a lot of people are concerned about that. So right. it would be good to, to share that, I think. And I'm sure it would be something that would be done, too, with the, at the schools, with right. the parent-teachers. Right. association and and because the school the teachers would be on board and there would be some training that would have to right. take place so yes right. okay great sorry it's okay Very low. and um regarding the avoid the 23 expenses i understand that's a you know program to to catch dui offenders so what what um what kind of campaign does what what have we done in our city for that and what how many drunk drivers do we see in, in this town? Well, the campaign is through the state, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Is that correct, Bob? And we, a, a grant. Okay. And, and it gets, so all the overtime that is, that's involved in the Void the 23, it involves all the agencies in San Mateo County. Right. And it's during certain times of the year, like, for example, Christ, the holiday time, Christmas time, and the New Year's Eve, where you're going to have a high percentage of, of, of drug drivers. So, we, it, it, so it's run by one agency will host it, and we send officers to participate in it, and they roam anywhere in, the, in San Mateo County looking for drunk drivers, and the numbers are recorded as a county. I see. Um, but the money and the overtime is paid by this grant. Okay. So we don't incur any costs. And, you know, the number, they take the number as one number, so I wouldn't be able to tell you specifically if they're, you know, what the number was here in town, because they do, it's a county-wide effort. Okay, all right, thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Yeah, I just have one more question. Yeah, go ahead. So, um, you know, we get a fair amount, a fair amount of, of comments uh, from the public in regards to parking and also running stop signs. So with the two new officers, do you see the quality of the engagement in town uh, going up so that, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, that type of presence will, will uh, reduce those incidents with running the stop signs and then perhaps being more proactive with getting on folks to, to not park their car on, you know, in a particular part of the street for a long time. Surely having the additional officers will help in, in many areas and enforcement, traffic enforcement being one of them. I mean, we do address a lot of those traffic areas if somebody calls in a specific intersection, which could be just around and just about anywhere, everywhere in town. But if somebody calls a specific intersection and we, we put it on our traffic board and that's part of the, the daily um, enforcement uh, areas that those officers will hit during their, their patrol time. But as you can see, when on day shift, if you have right now, which we currently have one sergeant and one officer, a lot of their time is spent, one officer may okay. be spending a lot of time inside writing. So, yes, when we bring on more officers, it will alleviate, um, you know, that one officer will be able to stay in and write on the reports while you still have others going out working traffic enforcement and some of the other 
the areas of concern. So it, it will make a difference. I mean, you're always going to have those that are just want to behave badly and are still going to, you know, run the stop signs. But surely the presence, you'll, there'll be more presence out on patrol. Very good. Yeah, because, you know, that, that, that makes our streets safer. Yes. So, thanks. Thank you. That's it, Clark. Is it? Okay. Go ahead. I have okay. one thing. One more. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Um, another, another thought. I'm thinking of that percentage of time for the day officer spent in report writing. It's just uh, 40 percent, yeah. Um, uh, I understand that there's now technology, speaking of up in the technology, in which you can just you know, speak into something, voice recognition, immediately turns it into writing. Um, it would seem to me that that might maybe reduce the percentage of time spent doing this. I don't know, just a thought. It's possible that you still have to, I know that we had something like that some years ago and, and you have to sometimes you have to go back and as you spend more time having to cle clean it up then it's then the time and the effort actually spent typing it because a lot of times some of these reports some of your basic reports there's already a template in that the officer may have written a similar report right. but it's 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 more the investigations that the calling of victims or trying to telephone individuals processing of uh, getting statements getting recorded statements maybe having to go down to the San Mateo County, the Keller Center or the Medical Center right. for exams. So all of that encompasses in the report writing because well, that's included it, in there. Right. It's under oh, that okay. should be worded investigations. And oh. when under investigations, one of the aspects is report writing, okay. evidence processing and all the other things that fall under under that area. Yeah, that makes more sense. Yes. And does the report writing have to occur like behind a, a desk or can do you have the like do you have laptops or the ability to use to do any reports while you're out? Um, sitting in a car there is we are we do have laptops in the car and uh, we encourage officers to take them out but you know sometimes uh, just depending on the day or, or the evening you know finding a, a safe place where you can kind of concentrate and and be still aware of your surroundings so that nobody comes upon you that you know want for officer safety reasons so that's also taken into consideration so but yes we do encourage them to use as much time go park maybe somewhere where you're visible on Bay Shore at the park and ride and you slow the traffic down because they see the, patro the patrol car while you're doing your report so yes that is encouraged that was <clears throat> oh, Bob can you can you uh, uh, on, on the mic? That, that's part of the advantage uh, of going to rims is their report writing um, component is much more comprehensive than the one we have now mm -hmm. so we will be encouraging officers to, to do more of the report writing in the car once we go to that new system but since it does involve the investigative component component um, you know uh, the officers need a desk they need a phone they need other things available so they they are always going to have to spend some time in the station to write some of the reports and do some of their investigations Okay, Lisa. Thank you very much. Um, I just have one one small request. As our new officers come on board, you know we're going to be moving our council meetings to Thursday nights, and maybe when uh, uh, they pass muster, that uh, perhaps uh, can bring them in and introduce them to the council, just so that uh, they know who we are and <clears throat> we know who they are. I've I've meet most of them anyway. You know, just. Uh, just being out and about, but I think it's good for the community to, to see, and it's good good visibility for the officers, you know, to kind of see how we function, too, you know, and just have them drop in, and you can introduce them or Bob or whoever. So. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that would be a great idea. Yes, thank okay. you. Yeah, no, I was thinking, you know, that, that they have this public works link, and Randy brings the whole crew in, you know? <laughs> That's kind of hard for. Her. <laughs> I, don't know, I was just thinking, how would you do that with the police department? You know, couldn't really. But but it is good to have everybody know who everybody is. I think that I really like that idea. Yeah. Right. And what I'd like to do too, is we'll send you an invitation when we do the swearing in, uh -huh. so that you can they come in with their families and it's a proud moment for them when they get their badge pinned on them as well. So right. I'll also include you in that email so that if you're available, you can stop by. Why the black band today? Uh, that's for the um, in respect for the uh, Las Vegas officers that were sh that were oh, shot in the in the restaurant. Yeah. Yes, I think their service is, wow. if I'm not mistaken, tomorrow. So then then the band comes off after they've been uh, laid to rest. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you very much. Keep up the good work. Thank you. 
Okay, uh, brings us to community development. And John, I guess you're up. <clears throat> they tell you why you put your last on here, right? No. no uh, <laughs> Stuart told me to save the best for last. <laughs> the best for last. Okay. I said if I have to sit here all night, so does he. <laughs> I had to read the draft DIR for open space and ecology. He's got to go through all the budget hearings. Exactly. I just thought it was fair. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Honorable Mayor, members of the council. Again, um, I don't know if this will be the best for last, but this will, should be fairly uh, quick, and I should be able to buzz through this presentation, take any questions you have. Uh, <laughs> environmental breakout, one of the items that, that we uh, do routinely on, that, on the pie chart ahead of you. Um, the Baylands and Baylands Ecology, and planning applications, city initiated planning efforts, administration, code enforcement, building and planning commission support. I know there was a request to give um, sort of some proportional breakdowns. Unfortunately, this pie chart doesn't reflect that, but I can walk you through that real quickly. We do have a half time code enforcement officer who's basically fully devoted to that function. Uh, have a, one and a half positions of administrative support and they primarily provide uh, building uh, department and building permit services um, and public information. Some limited support for planning commission, uh, administration, baylands and office administration, such as the maintaining the department's website, which is uh, something we really do make a point of trying to keep current with ongoing activities. Uh, then we have a half-time uh, special assistant, retired senior planner, Toon. His time is spent fully on city-initiated planning, which is the housing element update, as well as implementation of some of the zoning code amendments required for the last housing element cycle. Uh, a number of cases that the, the, the uh, planning subcommittee has seen and will continue to see as we try to finish implementing that uh, previous housing element. And then uh, the senior planner, full-time senior planner, um, primarily, you know, again, there's a cyclical nature to the work, but um, the last calendar year, last fiscal year, uh, probably spent about three-quarters of his time on the building permit uh, processing of uh, plan check, and we had a fairly busy uh, building year last year, um, about 15% of so on time of uh, private planning applications that are going before the planning commission and the remainder of his time spent on city initiated planning programs and um, there's a certain limitation on his time that i think we'll get into when we talk about some of the recommendations budget recommendations for next year and then my time uh, i spent um, anywhere from 50 to two-thirds of my time on baylands and recology based efforts uh, and the, the remainder of my time primarily on um, um, limited amount of time in administrative uh, and you know split my time among building issues and planning issues as well so but it, the, the Baylands is the bulk of my days are spent primarily on, on those ongoing efforts uh, I think again the couple of the new items that are being proposed for next budget year one is to upgrade the half time um, administrative position to full-time um, that'll help significantly in terms of coverage counter coverage when you have basically um, the public works counter and the planning counter those those two individuals when one, one of them leaves um, it makes the the coverage issue somewhat problematical isn't really great customer service provided um, the half-time position has aided that substantially I think there'd be a lot more benefit if we can get that additional half time. It'll also allow for um, some more proactive maintenance of um, our our uh, electronic building permit system, the Greenview system, which we utilize, but we haven't been able to, I think, fully uh, utilize to its capability because of limitations on on staff time and uh, really getting comfortable with the system and being able to roll it out a little more aggressively. So that would be one of the, I think, uh, another benefit of having that additional half-time position. Uh, and then again, the senior planner position, which we would anticipate um, potentially underfilling at a lower level, uh, bringing in someone who's not maybe a senior planner level. Um, and that would be primarily to um, 
provide additional staff resources for city initiated planning efforts as I indicated um, literally 90 percent 95 percent of the senior planners time is spent on privately initiated activities leaves very little time for um, for um, things like the green building ordinance update other code amendments that need to be done and the part-time position the retired planner position again that's limited to half time the hours are fairly um, you know it, it's his schedule is 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 his schedule he is a retired person he comes in and does his work when he needs to but uh, there isn't a lot of extra flexibility for staff in terms of giving him additional assignments uh, other activities that, that we really do think need to be done so as that position were to be filled we'd anticipate over time we'd rely probably less heavily on the half time that special assistant position uh, have him finish up some of the very discreet work programs he's undertaken not to date but that newer programs and additional activities would would be primarily within the the new positions responsibility so and I think some of these ongoing activities you know, again the, everyone's quite familiar with the Baylands EIR and the planning activities that uh, are ongoing a general plan update I think is something that ultimately the council is going to have to decide how you want to proceed with that that was a planning program that Bill Prince um, undertook uh, and there's a lot of both staff time and community time and Commission time and even council time kind of going through a component of that but given the uh, inability to get the EIR for the Baylands done in a timely way that that general plan update was uh, unable to be um, adopted in, in its entirety and at this point much of that work is five to seven years old and it really is going to be a question for the council you know with the Baylands EIR being published that does provide I think some good environmental foundation but there's still a number of policy questions for the council of do you want to rely on on some of this uh, older input frankly and, and work and and that's not a decision for you to make tonight but I think that's a dialogue we'll want to have with you um, over the upcoming um, year to really decide how you want to move forward there are certain things that need to be done in any event uh, I think we had a conversation at the Planning Commission with the subcommittee not too long ago and and kind of fleshed out some of the issues there's there's a number of technical requirements to update in the document um, there's filling in gaps from the environmental work that um, the Baylands EIR doesn't include you know areas outside the Baylands even on a cumulative basis and then uh, one thing I didn't I really didn't bring up when we discussed it at Planning Commission is the fact that the current update 2007 update didn't reflect any of uh, the 2010 census data so again you have an update uh, informational update to be provided so those are all ongoing uh, we would hope to have the latest version of the housing element adopted by uh, January of next calendar year 2015 to meet the state deadline uh, but then there's going to be a rollout of implementation measures required to to uh, fulfill the requirements of that housing element um, most prominently the mixed use uh, and rezonings for for additional residential sites that we did not accomplish from the last housing element primarily in the form of the Crocker Park mixed use and looking into some of those other extension of residential along the edge of Crocker Park so that would be a really an, a work program that again the new position would would support substantially in, in those efforts mm -hmm. um, and also whatever else comes out of the Crocker Park uh, technical assistance program if they're more planning programs or efforts that result from that that would give us some resources to accomplish that uh, with that that would conclude my comments I'd be glad to take any questions you have okay Lori sure. okay so in looking at the um, the budget for professional services I see that there's a what, what page Lori? on page 83 um, there's a substantial decrease from last year from 303,000 to 193,000 I'm wondering if you can talk about that it looks like there's nothing budgeted for the review of the general plan update as there was 75,000 for last year and I was wondering whether that was spent um, and then there's a decrease from 50 down to 25,000 for planning assistant can you talk about what that is and primarily those two one the general plan update was kind of a placeholder 
in the event we did move forward on a very formal basis uh, with the general plan update, given the delay in processing and publishing of the final of the draft EIR for the Baylands, uh, we did not utilize any of those services. So those are unspent monies, budgeted but unspent. Um, you know, will we get started this upcoming fiscal year? I mean, Stuart may speak to whether he's considering that a rollover or whatever. Uh, we also would anticipate that if we get that additional position in-house, that they could provide at least um, a good start on some of the services that are going to be required to update the, the actual document. Things like the technical side in terms of state law, making sure the document's compliant with state law. So we'd be able to do some of that service in-house with our uh, new position. So part of that would be sort of offset by, by, by the additional salary of having a new position if that's uh, what the council chooses to do. Planning assistance falls in that same category. Um, again, some of that is considered um, funding that was used to, um, to support that position, the, the half-time position. And so that kind of gets absorbed. That is in case there is something that comes up um, that's either unexpected in terms of um, that we need outside planning services, consulting services for a city-initiated um, program. No, nothing that I'm aware of at the moment, but if it's something would, were to come up in the course of the year. For example, with the... Um, uh, the TAP and some of that mixed-use zoning, we might want to look at getting some outside services to come up with either some assistance in a form-based code or other zoning tool to actually implement that. So example, those would be funds that would be available for that. And the other thing, the one-time expense was the ULI, uh, Crocker Park Charette. So. Okay. Thank you. Ready? So where does Tim show up in here? So um, the $25,000 that we have for the planning assistance mm -hmm. in 52235 is the money that we budget because when we budget for it, we're not always sure if it's going to be Tim, Tim specifically or if there's other outside planning assistance that we need. When we do use Tim, he's paid for out of salaries because he was he's part of, you know, he's on board of staff. So what you would anticipate is a less, when we use Tim, we won't use the full 25000 here, but we'll use a little bit. More, you know, be a higher in the salaries, but it, what we would anticipate is it's the twenty, it's that line item that says planning assistance, and it's either for Tim or for other outside planning assistance. Because mm -hmm. I n <clears throat> noticed that uh, you know, there's no part-time salaries in the approved budget for thirteen fourteen. At least it doesn't seem to be any figures here, and so that's why I'm trying to figure out. Okay, so where is he? Uh, and so it's, I'm presuming it's under professional services, but if he's under salary, then it would have to be part-time, right? So it, it, it would be, but so 13, 14 is still a budget number. Mm -hmm. So we wouldn't, you know, he, we wouldn't show anything there because it's what you budgeted, and we budget him to as a professional service okay. in 52235. But what you'll see is, you know, when we, at next year, when we have the 13, 14, we'd see a higher number in the part-time salaries, uh -huh. but we would have we will have a lower number spent in professional services. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's kind of a trade-off. It is. Okay. Okay. Got it. Um, so when you do all this Bayland stuff, <laughs> and a lot of it's uh, reimbursed from the developer. When they pay their bills, how does that get reflected in here? So, or does it? It, it doesn't. And the answer is, of course, always a yes and a no. So his time is budgeted to the general fund. However, within the revenues of the, in the general fund, we have a revenue source called developer reimbursement, and that is on page thirty-two. Mm -hmm. And council, um, I'm going to look to Clay two or three years ago, signed a new agreement with the developer where staff time would not be billed directly, but they would, but based on what we were averaging at that point in time, we would get quarterly payments from them, and we would just give them a flat dollar amount for all, for staff that we use. 
And I think that was three or four years ago that we signed that amendment to their agreement. So we receive 170, we budget about $174,000 for that purpose. How much? 174000 Okay. And that covers staff time. Okay. Because okay. I was just thinking that, you know, in, uh, in the case of the Community Development Department, um, you know, a lot of, of their activity is reimbursed. And one, of course, is developer reimbursement, which is by far the biggest, but then you get all the permit fees and so forth so mm -hmm. there's you know it's quite a bit is uh, covered with uh, with actual revenue of some sort or other um, and then unfortunately the way this is set up uh, you know that doesn't doesn't come through very clearly and so it was just uh, it was just an observation really I guess <laughs> um, uh, I like the idea of someone new in, in planning um, I think you know, with Tim's departure and, and the continuation of the huge workload related to the Baylands and also the general plan and so forth, I mean, there just isn't enough staff there. So I'm happy to see that. Uh, I hope you have uh, more luck than Lisa has had <laughs> in the Dude. recruitment area. Uh, I don't know whether there's everybody is hiring planners too. I don't know. But, uh, I know that can be frustrating. Mm -hmm. You know, when you, when you get the authorization of the decafied people. Um, but I'm assuming that it's not as difficult in the, in the planning world, am I right? I think right now it's, um, it could be more of a seller's market, I guess, but I, I'm confident we'll be able to get a very qualified pool of, of applicants. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, where does our special legal counsel for the the Baylands. Where does that show up in here? Uh, that wouldn't, because that's reimbursed by the developer. But so there isn't a, wouldn't show up at all. It does not. Mm. It's just an in and out. So it's when we talked about earlier, we talked about the trust accounts, right? In the seven hundred fund. Mm -hmm. So we don't budget for that directly because we don't know exactly what we're going to be spending, and it's just a whatever we bill, we get back. So we don't budget for that at the beginning of the year, anticipating what the workload will be. Because for those, the workload could vary as well as we may be getting new projects that we don't know about at the beginning of the year. So again, there's a question of, of, the, of the full impact of the activity, financial activity, full expenditures, full revenue is, is not really reflected in the in the way this is presented. Right. From a budget perspective, it is not. But from a accounting perspective, when we do the financial annual right. financial plan, right. we show all of, our, all of our revenues, all of our expenses for all funds. Okay. All right. And it's just a challenge of saying, you know, we don't know what work we're going to do from the right. Baylands up front. We don't know how much of the attorney we would use or how much we would, you know, if we need special um, assistance. Uh, so we don't budget for that up front okay. because it's just – it doesn't have an impact on city finances directly because uh -huh. it's just a reimbursed account. Uh -huh. So, when, but when you look at the annual report at the end of the year, you would see what was what we received and what we spent. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you, Terry. Um, I see we have an increase on the salaries um, requested budget, but that doesn't seem to collate with the flexible benefits um, increase that went from 54000 to 122000 I'm wondering if you can comment on that. So when we go from a part-time person to a full-time person, that goes from an unbenefited person to a full-benefited person. And then when we have the new person, that's another full-time benefited person. So those two could add upwards of fifty, uh, forty thousand dollars if they're both for a um, you know, family. Family. So that would be part of it. The other part of it is that we budgeted a five percent increase 
in both of the two years. We talked about the you know when we got the got the agreement, we did not budget a health increase in fiscal year 13, 14 as part of the budget, but we approved a contract that was a five you know, it was a five percent increase in health, and then we have another five percent increase in health budgeted for next year based on the contract. So those are the big, per those are like the major issues. Um, and I'd have to, you know, I'd have to go see if any other changes happened. Oh, the other issue was John's time last year was slightly budgeted in successor agency. Um, that was, you know, if we, you know, we, we did not do that again this year. So all of John's costs were budgeted here. So that increased the health benefits for that one as well for that portion of the cost because the concern is if you, you know as ray knows the concern is with the successor agency we were were getting questioned by the san mateo county college uh, college junior college district about wh how, how much time our staff is spending the trollers hmm the troller the troller <laughs> So this year we decided, you know, there was no time that John spent on the successor agency. We, we did not know that going into it, but the successor agency is much more of a financial system issue and it's much more of a management as opposed to a planning issue. So we removed him from that budget. So those are the, you know, I can, if you want, I can go a little bit more in depth after I looked at my spreadsheet. And then along those same lines the deferred compensation so for new employees we don't do the supplemental stipend so all new employees with us after 2008 get a deferred comp as opposed to supplemental stipend because it saves us money in the long run so as we get new employees the deferred comp goes up give me an explanation of, of those terms sure deferred compensation is so the agreement that we have with our employees and this was what we did in 2008. So in 2008, we negotiated with our employees a number of issues that would save us money in the long term. One of them, of course, is the PERS, where we went from a 2.7 for employees to a 2.0 for new employees hired after 2008. The other issue that we looked at was our long-term retiree health costs. Um, prior to 2008, we had an agreement with our employees where an employee who works with the city for a certain number of years would get access, would get a supplemental stipend payment for the rest of their life based on the Kaiser rate. And that, of course, is what the OPEB issue is and becomes very expensive for cities going, down the, going further down the road. As health insurance costs went up, we recognized what that increase would be. So in 2008, we said for new employees hired after 2008, instead of giving them a supplemental stipend in retirement, we would instead do a deferred comp where we would give them a defined contribution. The defined contribution is, and I'm going to try and remember this without looking at the contract, I think it's 1.5% that we would just give them, and then if they did another 5%, Another 2.5% of their money, we would do another 1% kicker for that. So we budget for 2.5% for new employees who've been hired after 2008 to be in deferred comp, as opposed to what it would cost us to pay on a supplemental stipend or the long-term uh, retiree health costs. So it's a post-employment benefit, but we're it, paying it. But we're doing it. At, we, we went from a defined a defined benefit plan to a defined contribution plan. Thank you. Welcome. That's the key. That last phrase. That that really is. Uh, you know, as I as we talked about the retiree health. You know, our OPEB right now we think is right around that six million dollar, mm -hmm. but it's not going to grow with new employees to the same extent because we went to from a, that defined benefit plan going forward to a defined contribution plan for new employees. And we also allowed existing employees to participate in that, and that reduced us from, I think, at our high, we had an $8 million deferred compensation uh, OPEB number, and I think we're down to $6 million based on people taking the deferred, taking the defined benefit up front. So that has saved us money. 
in the long term. That's the only questions I have. Thank you. And thank you, Clark. Um, yeah, all my questions in regards to the budget have already asked, but there was uh, something that came up that I'd, I'd like to understand. So, Stuart, um, uh, you talked about how John's salary is, is it's all in here, though, and, and, and compensating uh, for work that's done on the Baylands. It's not part of our contract to pay for salaries. But um, so we have this $174,000 that is paid by UPC. Does that show up as, as revenue? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And it's not just for John's time. I mean, there's a portion of Clay's time was in it, sure. portion of my time, portion of Betsy's time, portion of uh, Randy's time, a portion of Lynn's time who does the billing. And what we found was that, you know, it's difficult for us to track every minute as you would have to when you're trying to get a reimbursement. Mm -hmm. So what we said is, you know, we took a, I think it was a six month average or a year average of what people were doing. And we said, here's what the cost is. All right. All right. Thank you. As a follow up, is that going to increase as time increases and planning gets more involved as this process moves forward? I would have to look at what the agreement said. There, there's a cost of living increase in it. Yeah. But if we want, if we felt that there was a significant increase in staff time that we felt we should be compensated for, that would be something we'd have to open up a new round of negotiation on. And And fees such as what we get on the soil processing are supposed to cover the costs of, of administering that program on its own? Well, yeah, but they're just the general, they're just a revenue to the general fund. But yeah, the, the um, yeah, there is a, there is a, a uh, administrative fee on that too. So that, that you're, you're right. You're correct. Thank you. There's, there's a whole, number of fees that UPC pays. <laughs> um, we probably could put together a list for you at some point. Um, so there's very, various different categories. But in terms of the staff reimbursement part, um, we went to this model a few years ago, and I think it's probably still pretty reflective of the, of the, um, the work. Um, you know, it's something we may want to revisit at some point, depending on, you know, how things go forward in the future. Thank you. Um, the plan and check building inspection outsourcing. Um, still happy with that? Uh, with CSG? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I think they provide good service, uh, pretty good value to the to the city and to our clientele. Um, having that kind of institutional knowledge of buildings and projects is, is really invaluable, I think. I mean, there's always the ability to reopen that, but um, on my on my side, I'm quite happy with their performance. Okay. Any other questions? Nope, I'm good. John, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, John. Keep up the good work. So, uh, Stuart, you wanted to talk about something. Yes. So the next step in the process is on June 19th, I'll bring you the, a number of different resolutions, as I always do. I'll bring you the appropriation limit, which talks, which is how much money we're allowed to collect in taxes versus how much money we do collect in taxes. I will bring you the master fee schedule. Um, I will bring you the successor agency and go more talk more about the successor agency next week. The other one is the city's budget uh, resolution for adoption adoption resolution. Um, so what we normally what we do with that one is we have what's called Exhibit A, which shows all the changes that have been made by the city council in the budget. Uh, I updated that through what we did on Monday night. I am not in the office. Until again until Wednesday of next week, so I will not update Exhibit A for the changes you made. You talked about tonight to be added. 
So what I will do at that time is bring you a new, <clears throat> sorry, a new resolution and a new Exhibit A on Thursday night for you to see. All right. And then, so that's the process pro aspect of it. The other issue that um, we're, you know, we're going to be dealing with, and I didn't talk about this, and I apologize when it, um, for the, on the pool issue, was that we have our two head lifeguards will be leaving us this year. They're finally moving on with their lives. So what we're looking at doing is replacing those two positions with what I would call, with what we're calling a recreation coordinator who will be working probably 40 hours during the summer and then maybe 30, 20 to 30 hours the rest of the year as opposed to the head lifeguard positions that we have now. There should not be a change in the overall cost for these positions for this for us, but it will give us a, a more hands-on ability to deal with some of the issues that you had talked about with the pool and having somebody being more directly responsible for the pool. Indeed. And they're not at the same level that we had as a supervisor, still trying to save that money. So this person would still report through Steve to whoever's, you know, through my, to myself or to Clay, whoever is in charge of the Parks and Recreation Department at that time. And they'll have a lifeguard certification? They will. So they'll be able to be on deck. And then the, the one other thing you'll see next Thursday, um, just so that you're aware of it, is that we'll be bringing forward a number of job classification updates to reflect the things that we're talking about here in the budget, including what Stuart just talked about with the recreation quarter coordinator. We'll update a, um, a job spec on that to um, identify the aquatic uh, background required for that position. And um, I think we got the engineering assistant and some of the other other right, so we have an engineering tech, the recreation coordinator, we have the payroll and um, utility technician that we talked about at the very beginning in the finance department. We have um, a couple of other just general updates to make the classifications. And I can't remember the what they were. Position. The planning position. So th th that's I think there's like a little bit expedited from what you've seen in the past. So we're trying to get that all kind of coordinated with the budget adoption so that the, the budget's ready to go in terms of being implemented. Right, and we can start recruiting starting July 1st because without the specifications, we can't start the recruitment process. Questions? I have, I have one uh, comment. Thank you for giving us this sheet with the one-time expenditures, would it be possible to update that with the associated cost next to it? Yes. So that if it's something that we decide is not fit into our budget, that we can yes. see what we may or may not want to do. Okay. Thank you. Just one process thought. Um, so you're going to be working on the updates based on conversation tonight, next Wednesday, right? Or this weekend. Uh, <laughs> well, I won't push it, but uh, it, it would—I don't know—it would be helpful to me anyway if I could see it at least before the meeting. Okay. Maybe by email or something. Sure. Like I mean, you'll see some of them because I updated it based on what you did last week right. or Monday night. So right. I can get, um, let me see what I can do and get it, I'll get it to you before, I'll get it emailed to you before the meeting. Okay. Great. So we're not going to have that information for review until? Right, I'm, I'm in Half Moon Bay Thursday and Friday. And Betsy is actually, the reason she left early tonight She's on a plane tomorrow morning at 5.55 in the morning or some god-awful hour like that that will hear her flying overhead <laughs> in town. Okay. <clears throat> and it? So it's a think quick on your feet next week for our budget decisions. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. I'll make that motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, we're adjourned.